Between the release of GTA San Andreas in 2004 and GTA 4 in 2008, Rockstar Games released several more titles under the name Grand Theft Auto that were meant to serve as sort of side entries to keep the fanbase satiated while work continued on their next big leap in technology and storytelling. These included the often forgotten GTA Advance, released the very same month as San Andreas, and then, more importantly to today's story, GTA Liberty City Stories in 2005. Liberty City Stories was, in many ways, an experiment. It reused the assets for Liberty City used in GTA 3 and told a completely new story, taking place three years before the events of that game. It served to set up a great deal of the story that Claude would participate in, specifically the game's first antagonist in Salvatore Leone, a fan-favorite portrayal due in no small part to the voice acting of Frank Vincent. LCS was rather simple. After all, it was released originally as an exclusive on the PlayStation Portable. The very first version of the handheld was itself a new experiment for Sony, attempting to compete with the likes of Nintendo for a place in the handheld market. And what better franchise to test those waters with than one of the most successful on the original PlayStation 2, which played a significant role in making that console as successful and well-known as it was. LCS had a slimmed-down cast, with the protagonist, a returning character from 3, Tony Cipriani, being recast, though it did see the return of a few heavy hitters, including Frank Vincent. It had far fewer fully animated cutscenes than 3, VC, or SA had. Its missions were designed to be playable specifically on the more limited control scheme of the PSP, but in general, it was an accessible GTA title that felt perfectly tailored to the needs and capabilities of the handheld device. It was also wildly successful. It single-handedly kept the handheld relevant and propelled its sales far beyond anything it would have gotten without a fully playable GTA title. In fact, it ended up outselling the subject of today's video, which was itself an attempt to capitalize on the success and momentum that Liberty City Stories was able to generate. See, after how well LCS sold for such a comparably smaller budget to, say, the last three main titles, needing significantly less work done for asset creation, Rockstar had the brilliant idea to try and strike gold twice. They had just revisited Liberty City, so why not Vice City next? So, literally the very next year, in 2006, they released Vice City Stories, the logical next step in this new, potential mini-series that seemed to be forming, the Stories Games. Only this time, they went all in, taking the lessons learned from developing LCS and attempting to cram as much as the tiny little PSP could handle into this next portable GTA title. Vice City Stories had a much bigger budget. It was Vice City after all, so no corners could be cut on the soundtrack. Philip Michael Thomas as Lance was brought back, continuing the trend of the stories games being prequels that set up the events of their respective console parent. New features were added which combined the gang territories and the property development present in San Andreas and Vice City respectively. And most noteworthy of all, they even brought in their first official celebrity cameo by getting Phil Collins himself to appear on the in-game radio, in several actual missions as a character that the player actually meets, and even fully motion capturing a performance Collins did in Real World Miami in the mid-80s, all inside the Renderware engine. VCS was, in many ways, what LCS couldn't be. Bombastic, ambitious, attempting to be bigger and better than the original VC in so many ways. And, not to mention, a lot harder than any GTA title that had been released up to that point had ever been. Especially in its original, handheld form. Both LCS and VCS 
would eventually be ported over to the PS2, where I originally played them, having no idea that they were actually PSP exclusives first. And in these versions, even more content was added to each to further incentivize people to buy them again. So when I originally played LCS and VCS, I thought they were just the next Grand Theft Auto games. I remembered loving them for the most part, almost as much as 3 and VC, and I considered them mainline entries like those were. But VCS didn't sell very well, at least not in comparison to LCS, which actually beat it with a smaller budget, even if the two did claim the spot of being the best-selling PSP games ever made. Still, it underperformed as far as Rockstar and their profit margins were concerned and that might be a big reason why we never got a San Andreas Stories. So today, I am going to begin revisiting Vice City Stories. Given all that has changed for me in the last few months that most of my longtime fans already know about, this may very well be one of the last times that I play a GTA game on the Game Vault for a while, and I will be attempting a week-by-week -week format once again, eventually compiling all the parts into one big video once it's done. I am playing the game on a PS2 emulator because I simply don't have a copy of the original on PS2 or capture equipment, and the PS2 version is just overall a lot better than its original handheld counterpart, both on the original hardware and on emulation. I will, however, be playing with a PS4 controller to keep that familiar DualShock control scheme for a bit of added authenticity. So, without further ado, let's jump into it with the first real mission, since unlike GTA VC or San Andreas, there is no long intro to watch. We are just launched headfirst into my favorite setting that the GTA franchise has ever tackled, which we'll finally be revisiting soon enough the sun-drenched shores of Vice City, in this game, in the mid-1980s. So, our very first mission is straight to the point and wastes very little time. Our protagonist, Victor Vance, doesn't actually go on duty for a few days, supposedly, and is, more importantly, and like I imagine a lot of people in his position, strapped for cash. Mostly because he needs to pay for his brother Pete's asthma medication, but also because his other brother, as he puts it, is sick in a different way, and likely frequently eats into the family's budget with his often less-than-legal antics. So, Vic's CO sees an opportunity for exploitation and pressures the new recruit into doing favors for him in exchange for a little bit of extra cash. A pitiful amount, too. I did the math. If we assume that what we, the player, are given for completing the mission is actually how much Jerry pays us, well, it ain't much. But desperate times call for desperate measures, so Vic agrees to collect a package for Sergeant Martinez, Jerry, huh? I mean Jerry, and then bring it back to base. Jerry is clearly using his position as a commanding officer for the army to smuggle in and distribute illicit substances. Nothing particularly crazy, just a bit of grass, but that might as well be the hardest of hard drugs as far as the U.S. government in the 1980s is concerned, so Vic is taking a major risk here. All the mission asks us to actually do is first drive Jerry's bike over to a terminal at the airport, right around the corner, and then meet his dealer. The dealer brings Vic to his private boat, and they go for a short ride, presumably for the sake of looking less suspicious, but... Pretty soon, things get hairy. The dealer says that Vice City is getting too dangerous for his kind of work these days, and thus, his cut of the profits will be going up, telling Vic to pass on the message to Jerry. But they don't get the chance to chat much when a group of unidentified men show up to shoot up the boat, killing the two innocent ladies on the dealer's boat and the dealer himself, while Vic jumps into the water. It might also be worth noting that Vic pulls out an M16 here, at the drop of a hat, to shoot back at the baddies, but when he leaps into the water, all he keeps is the standard pistol. Makes sense, but just goes to show that he is, and always was, prepared to get serious as soon as the situation calls for it. 
So this very first mission introduces us to the fact that, thank God, unlike the original VC, having now had the hindsight benefit of San Andreas a couple years prior, in VCS, we can actually swim. Although, unlike San Andreas, not forever. There is a stamina meter that appears when you jump in the water, meaning that if you swim around for too long, you will drown, which makes sense. Odds are, though, you won't ever end up in a situation where you'll actually use all of your stamina, but you do have to be careful not to get cut to ribbons as you swim to shore here, since the attackers continue shooting at you until you escape. As soon as you get to land, though, they give up pretty quickly, thankfully, and then all that's left is to run back to your barracks to stash the stuff underneath Vic's bed. And with that, we get our first mission complete. And $50, which, again, adjusted for inflation is about $150 today. I mean, that would have been worth it if all Vic had to do was just meet the guy, get the stuff, and come back, but it's GTA, so it was never going to be that simple. If the person paying wasn't his literal CO, I'd say Vic should demand additional compensation for the trouble alone. He also doesn't tell Jerry that his old contact slash dealer is dead either. The chaos that we just went through never actually comes up in conversation, oddly enough. After that, I did a bit of driving around in one of the base's Patriot Hummers, but there isn't a whole lot to do this early in the game for someone like me. See, if you're new to the channel, for characters like Vic or Nico, I tend to, at least, and especially in these early parts of the game, try to roleplay the way that I think makes the most sense for the character. So, technically, I could go steal a taxi and make some extra cash really early, or start hunting for hidden packages, or 99 Luff Balloons, <laughs> nice reference, but I will not be doing so. Instead, I just drive around for a bit, killing zero civilians, and then return to base for a nap. The next day, I'll tackle the next Jerry mission. That mission is Cleaning House. Now that Jerry has had Vic do some work for him, he's got him. And so one favor and nothing else, of course, leads to a second favor, which I'm sure will lead to a third. See, Vic, like many GTA protagonists throughout the years and the series' history, but not all of them, has an objection to the use of drugs. As we'll see later, only when it's convenient, but I digress. Because of Vic's reluctance to be involved with drugs, Jerry instead suggests that he help bring in guns. That's fine, right? Totally different and not at all actually objectively worse at all. Great moral call, Vic. Actually, we aren't going to get the guns at all, just the money that Jerry's contact owes him for a shipment of guns. So it's off to meet a character who played a minor role in the original VC, but who is a much more important character this time around, Phil Cassidy. We head down to a shooting range at the docks and find a group of all guys suspiciously in sync with one another and shooting their not at all overcompensating 44 magnums with scopes. And then there's this guy. Well, as it turns out, he was in the service. Sort of. And so he and Vic are instantly casual friends, I suppose. Phil says he doesn't have the money that we're meant to collect from him, so we drive him over to his old apartment and find out what the catch is. Turns out, Phil was recently forcibly evicted from his apartment by a group of Mexican gangsters called the Cholos, and the money is inside, under the floorboards. So, without a moment's hesitation, Vic agrees to casually murder some people and break into the apartment to retrieve the money, and we are given our first real taste of combat. Only a couple guys here put up a fight, one of them running off, but Vic is a soldier, so... Boop! And then inside, it's just two more in close quarters. Grab the cash, steal one of their Sabre Turbos, very nice, and then drive back to Fort Baxter to give it to Jerry and take our cut. A hundred dollars this time, which is obviously double what we made last time, so... 300 bucks roughly in today's money. Not bad, but still not much at all. Then again, living on the army base, Vic presumably has no bills, and can thus send all of the money to his brother. I mean, he doesn't, it goes right into our pocket, and if we choose to, we can just spend it all pretty damn soon, but whatever. Mission complete. 
And finally, on the third day, Vic rose again, from his bed, that is, to start the mission, Conduct Unbecoming. Uh-oh, well, that doesn't sound like it's going to have a happy ending. Oh, well, what do we got this time? Well, this time, Jerry wants us to get him a girl, Mary. Now, I think this is an intentional joke, but I always thought it was funny that we're looking for an actual woman named Mary, and that it wasn't just Jerry being cute about collecting some more Mary wanna you know? But no, it's an actual woman, a working girl named Mary, who is apparently so well known by just her first name that the very first girl that we find at the docks knows exactly who we're talking about and where to find her. I mean, working girls tend to stick together, so maybe it was more than a coincidence that she knew, but I'd have to assume that there would be many Marys in a city of... Wait, how, how big is Vice City supposed to be? One sec. 1.8 million? Uh, yeah, that is some incredible luck on Vic's part. Oh, right, and just before that, we also go to meet Phil at his recently liberated apartment, and he presents Vic with a flashy sports car that is apparently a gift from Martinez. Huh. That car is easily worth several thousand dollars. Seems the thing to do here would be to sell it, but, um, Vic isn't the best at making good decisions. He is a GTA protagonist, after all. I don't think the car actually comes up in the twist at the end. Spoilers. But I don't actually think you need to use this car specifically. I didn't test it, but when given the car, the game does not give you an objective to take it. Meaning you can probably just ignore it and take any car you want, but it does very clearly expect you to take it. So that's what I always do. We take Mona over to Starfish Island and find Mary at a party with some very Miami Vice-type individuals. Vic, being a military man, once again wastes no time and murders the men who seem to think they own her. Ugh. And then effectively coerces Mary into coming with him since, you know, he did just murder several people in front of her. I'd go too, girl. I'd go too. But apparently, this isn't the first time Mary has seen Martinez, who, shocker, is both a pig and a cheap one at that, still owing her for the last time. As it turns out, though, Mary and the car were part of a setup. A setup to have Vic kicked out of the army because, I assume, Martinez finds his sanctimonious hypocrisy to be a potential threat. Probably worried that eventually Vic would at least try to report him to a higher authority. I don't remember if it's ever fully explained why Jerry does this, but that does seem like the most likely reason. So Vic gets dishonorably discharged for conduct unbecoming of a soldier. Get it? But thankfully, he also immediately gets a page from Phil, his new buddy, offering to let Vic stay at his apartment that he recently cleared out for him, down by the ocean docks. Well, that's one more mission complete. And more importantly, that's the end of the first mission thread for Martinez and the effective end of the game's prologue. So after that, to break things up a little bit, I decided to try my hand at taxi missions for a little while, but not too long. I got bored after about five, which is odd, because normally I love the taxi missions as a distraction. Thing is, something they introduced with VCS is some of the taxi fares being like tailing missions. Yeah, I know. In fact, it seemed like one in four or something fares turned into follow that vehicle, and that is frankly just boring, so I decided to take some of the money I'd earned and spend it on some new guns instead. Around this time, I also noticed that there was a purchasable bulletproof Sanchez dirt bike available outside of Vic's apartment. One of the exclusive things added in the PS2 version, as far as I know, because I definitely don't remember this from my PSP playthrough. Thing is, purchasable vehicles don't function like in, say, GTA V. You don't buy it, and then it, say, infinitely respawns at Vic's house. No, no. You buy it, and then you get it once, until it blows up, or you lose it. Just like any other vehicle on the street. Now, eventually, I'll have enough money that doing things like this will be no big deal, and there will be some much better vehicles available for purchase, but as of right now, it just kind of seems like a waste of money. Especially since the only reason to buy a bulletproof Sanchez is so that it doesn't blow up, 
but you can still take damage on your motorcycle while driving around, even be killed, so it's almost completely pointless. Lame. I then decided to try my luck on another bike by trying vigilante missions on a police bike, which was introduced in San Andreas, but not present in the original VC. So, I guess they get banned in the next two years? But, well, I got busted and lost all the guns I had just purchased, which put me off trying again, even though I could have just cheated it all back, but uh, it just ruined the mood, you know? Back to missions. So it's finally time to start the next mission thread, and our first one is a disgraced former soldier. Working for Phil Cassidy and being mildly xenophobic towards Mexicans. I mean, Phil has plenty of different kinds of xenophobia baked into him, including towards men just like Vic. However, apparently being brothers in arms is enough for him to look past it. When he can see through his drunken haze, that is. So, as demonstrated in his first mission, Phil has a problem with this Cholo gang, who have been muscling in on his gun-running business. So he asks us to come with him to literally just search around town for any Cholo we find and kill them. How elegant. We have to first drive to the police station, but when none show up, Phil demonstrates the one thing that he and I have in common, a distaste for the police and that it's off to see if we can find any at the hospital. I feel like, I don't know, checking their gang territory would have been the best way to find them, but this is not San Andreas, so it doesn't quite work like that. Anyway, we get lucky the second time, and a cholo gangster is just walking down the street when he spots us, hops into his car, and then we must give chase. All we gotta do here is get and stay close enough to their car to give Phil a chance to start shooting. Luckily, unlike us, Phil doesn't need to be directly parallel with the car and can just shoot out the side window. But eventually, Phil lights up their car, the Cholo tries to run, gets caught in the car's explosion, and voila, that's it. Well, not quite, actually. He also asks us to take his car to a pay-and-spray afterwards because the game assumes we must have damaged it pretty bad in the chase. In reality, I'd barely messed up the bumper, but I didn't want to retry the whole mission just to see what he would say if we didn't damage the truck at all. So instead, I tried being cheesy in a different way, driving the truck up to my apartment instead to see if I could repair it for free at my garage instead of the shop. Nope, turns out they actually thought of that, so we have to go to a pay and spray after all, but thankfully it doesn't matter which one, so we can just use the one around the corner from Phil's and then drop him off for a mission complete and a couple hundred bucks compensation. So then I decided I was going to tackle one of the side missions, which in Vice City Stories are all a little bit longer. See, in all other games of the 3D era, meaning everything before VCS, you had to complete 12 levels in order to finish them. 12 firefighter missions, 12 vigilante, 12 paramedic, and 100 taxi fares in order to become fireproof, get extra armor, infinite sprint, and something different in each game for the taxi. Oh, and also starting in the original VC, there was the pizza delivery, but anyways, not the point. The point is that in VCS, we now have 15 levels to complete instead of 12, which sounds like it's way worse at first. However, in addition to more levels, you can now finally get checkpoints at every five. So if you complete the first five levels and then fail at level eight, when you go to continue, you'll be starting at five, which is a much needed and very welcome change. It's just too bad that it took them until the very last game in the 3D era to figure that out. Since after this, with the release of 4 and onward, everything changes anyways. So I tend to always do at least the ambulance missions in each game because having infinite sprint is so freaking useful, and thus I resigned myself to completing them all in one go. Also. I tend to like doing the paramedic missions as early as possible, so that there's no chance I ever 
have to go all the way to the other side of the map, even though I don't think having them unlocked necessarily means you'll have to. I just have this weird, paranoid feeling that it could. Now the best way to complete these, since it does take a while to do all 15 levels, is to put on some music. Perhaps even the GTA Radio on Spotify, which looks at your existing musical tastes and creates a personal playlist for you from the tracks across the series. And then just go to town. It took me a while, a little over an hour of drive here, drive there, but having those checkpoints made me a lot less worried about screwing up. And as it happens, I didn't screw up, so that's also nice. And now I can sprint as long and as often as I'd like to, which will for sure come in handy throughout this occasionally brain-bashingly difficult entry in the series. Now, onwards we go. So next, I decided to jump into a new mission thread to shake things up a bit. Or down, I suppose, with the mission, uh, shakedown. Now, this mission introduces us to the first act's antagonist. It doesn't take a genius or a GTA veteran to know that this will be the first guy we work for that we end up taking down, and for good reason. Marty J. Williams is among the worst human beings we ever see in the entire series. He is an abusive, racist, misogynistic bully, and although he is framed as being awful and Victor is positioned as being sympathetic to his wife, Louise, who he is regularly violent to, Vic still decides to work for Marty in order to make money that he supposedly sends to his family. Again, that money actually ends up in the hands of an ammunition store clerk, but whatever, I guess. This mission has already shifted my previously positive opinion of Victor. There are plenty of ways to make money that do not involve helping a crazy, violent psychopath run a protection racket. In fact, I almost want to say that Vic doing what he does while simultaneously pretending to be self-righteous and better than Marty makes him worse. At least with Marty you know what you're getting, but Vic will literally aid him in doing the awful things he does and then turn around and condemn everyone but himself. Granted, this hypocrisy will come up later on in the story more than once. It's arguably a central part of Vic's character, but one that I've perhaps ignored in the past due to my own naivete and privilege. Not anymore, though. I have a feeling by the end of this game, my opinion on Victor will be dramatically different than it's been in the past. Anyway, the actual mission sees us being introduced to Marty's business, a protection racket, as I said, starting with us going to a shop in Little Havana and taking down some cholos who come to attack the place. First, a couple outside, and then a couple inside. Marty chastises the owner for letting them into his store, and we're off to take another cholo store by force to make up for the frustration and lost revenue from his own front being attacked. At that next door, we are tasked with destroying some of the shop to intimidate the shop owner, to which Vic initially objects. Again, he is a massive hypocrite because his resistance amounts to, no, don't, stop, and then he does exactly what he's told for his paycheck. A few more cholos show up, and we have to take them out, but that's it. A simple mission to let us meet our first secondary antagonist. Moving on. Heading back to do another fill mission, Next, we have one that I have previously listed as among the worst missions in the entire series, Boomshine Blowout. See, Phil is a pathetic, drunken mess. No news there, and his stash of Boomshine is under attack by the Cholos. So, for some reason, despite the cutscene ending with it looking like Vic is going to leave, as he should have, instead he decides to enable Phil and risk his own life, by heading down to the warehouse to try and save the booze. What a great idea. Well, when we get there, the whole place is on fire, and then it's on Vic, on us, to drive a forklift through the burning building and collect four separate crates of the stuff before it puts the boom into the boom shine, you know? Now, this is stupid simple, 
Just drive the forklift to the crates, lift them up, drive them back to Phil's truck. The annoying part is that A, forklift controls are a little annoying. I mean, they aren't really different from regular controls, but it just feels a little more awkward to maneuver this damn thing. And B, the time limit they give you is actually quite tight, so you don't have a ton of room for experimentation or failure. Each time you collect a crate, some of the path you've been using is blocked off by debris from the warehouse falling apart around you, meaning you need to take a slightly longer path each time. Thankfully, there are only the four crates to collect because otherwise this mission could be seriously, seriously annoying. I wouldn't say it's a good mission, and definitely not very exemplary of what you look for in a GTA game, but still, it is a bit of a challenge. However, I, unlike most people who played this game back in the day, have save states, and you can bet that I will be using them to save myself some time in repeating obnoxious things, because, trust me, VCS will throw plenty of obnoxiousness our way. Luckily, I haven't had to actually use them yet, and I completed this mission on the first try. But it was a bit close, as I said, because that timer is not very generous, and, not to mention, I knew what I was getting myself into, and have done this mission many times in the past. Alrighty, time to ping-pong back to another mission for the horrible Marty J. Williams. What has he got for us this time? Well, we've got a bit of diversification with Marty's many illegal businesses. There's little to nothing in the way of context for what we're doing this time. Instead, the mission's cutscene serves to show just how awful Marty is, once again, with him continuing to threaten, harass, and demean his wife, to the point of her deciding to move out with her child and go stay at her sister's. Thank God. Not that it will guarantee her safety whatsoever, since he threatens to go after her anyway, on top of insulting her for not being thin enough. Marty is just completely irredeemable. Like, at least the game's main antagonist is charismatic, but Marty... Marty is just awful with a capital A. So this mission involves us doing not protection racket work, but repossession work. First, we are tasked with retrieving two separate vehicles and returning them to the business. The first one is a cheetah being washed by the owner, who also happens to be one of Vic's neighbors. I employ the tried and true strategy of attempting to park my car on top of him before the dialogue with him can even begin. It doesn't quite work, but I managed to escape without a fight. The second car, though, is on the move, so I try to park my car in front of it at the intersection and then go jack the driver, but he's a bit smarter than most and actually starts to back up and escape. So I fire my gun at the car a bunch and he flees, but, well, that means the car is damaged now, which also means I have to take it to a pay and spray to repair it because... I have to bring it back to the business. Upon returning it, I wondered if the game would consider it delivered and still let me take it to the third objective to find a van of stolen TVs. But nope, it actually accounted for the possibility of me doing that. Not a problem though, as I can take the infinitely respawning Admiral here to go and grab it. This time the strat of park and run actually works though, preventing the dudes from being able to attack me or try and stop me. But as soon as I get into the van, I am given two stars. Not two I actually have to lose, though, as I can just go right to Marty's to complete the mission. The cops in VCS are, from what I'm seeing so far, significantly less aggressive than the original VC or any other 3D-era title. Perhaps on par with LCS, but... I can't remember how they are in that game. I think the reason for this is partially, or entirely, because even on the PS2 port, the draw distance in VCS is way shorter than the already very tiny one in the other 3D PS2 games, because of the fact 
that originally it ran on the PSP. So, cops take longer to spawn in, and when they do, there are usually fewer of them. That, and they seem to turn at you much later than they did before. Either that, or I've just gotten good at dealing with cops in these older games, that they very rarely give me any real trouble, unless it's like four stars or more. And even then, sometimes. But that's another mission complete for Marty, and upon completion, we also open up a new thread, since Louise is now staying at her sister's house, and she invites Vic to come over and say hi. Maybe we'll do that next time. Well, her first mission, When Fun Day Comes, is a very, very simple and easy one. It's just a two-lap race, but we'll get to that in a second. First, let's talk about the cutscene and some of the implications it brings. So, Vic goes to see Louise at her sister's, but crucially, it does not appear as though her sister is actually there at the moment. Now, here is where Vic first acknowledges how much of a hypocrite he is, and also first brings up what is, I suppose, the game's excuse for where all of Victor's money is going, being used to buy drugs by his mother. But more worrying is something I never really thought about before that relates to Louise here. She is, perhaps, one of the worst mothers of all time. She apparently seemingly leaves her child, a baby, at home alone. Um, no, not okay. I mean, the game straight up acknowledges this twice. Vic and Louise start to bond, and Vic asks if she wants to hang out, to which Louise agrees, saying there's a quad bike race at the trailer park. Yes, the very same trailer park she ran away from, where she would be very likely to run into Marty. Okay, so that's a horrible idea, but leaving your baby at home? Alone? What the hell's wrong with you? Victor himself literally begins the mission by asking if the baby will be okay at home while they go out and act like idiots, and Louise is like, ah, it's fine, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it? What? The actual race is so simple it's barely worth mentioning. Just two very short laps around the trailer park area. It's literally over in a single minute. After we win, Vic once again says that he's worried about the baby being home alone, and Louise is still unconcerned. Jesus, how did I ever overlook this about her? These two are so much worse than I ever realized before. Like, what is wrong with you? Vic offers to drive her home from the trailer park that she literally ran away from, but she turns him down. This mission, more than anything, serves to show the spark between the two and that they are both interested in one another, but that's about it. It also shows that maybe they're better for each other than I ever realized before because they're both awful. But it's barely even a mission, I feel like. I'm also starting to notice how simple a lot of missions in VCS can be. Again, probably relating to the fact that it was originally a PSP title and a lot more limited in its scope. Even if they did pull out a lot more stops for it than, say, the previous PSP game, Liberty City Stories, which I'll get to eventually, maybe. Anyway, mission complete. Immediately after that, I unlocked some races over at Sunshine Autos, as well as the ability to purchase the quad bike that I just used. Oh yeah, I haven't really mentioned that, but VCS introduced the ability to buy certain vehicles. Er, wait, did I mention this? I don't know, I guess the GTA Online trend of turning the series into Grand Buy Auto started here. Now, when you purchase something, it does not respawn, you simply spawn it into the world, and then if you want to keep it, you need to bring it to a garage, like any other. If you want it again later because you lost it, you'll have to buy it again. But anyway, I briefly considered doing some races, but instead did one of the game's many rampages. 
something that was absent from San Andreas, but is otherwise present in all other 3D-era games. The one that I did was right next to one of the buildings in the Sunshine Autos complex, and the goal was to kill 15 Cholos in the time limit given. Now, one thing I think they've changed since at least the original VC, if I remember correctly, is that now the cops do get involved while you're doing rampages. Maybe I'm creating a false memory here, but I seem to recall in GTA 3 and the original Vice City, starting a rampage would temporarily protect you from gaining wanted stars. I have no idea if that was true in LCS, though. But in this game, you will have to deal with the cops trying to stop you while you attempt to complete the rampage objective. It got a little hairy here, but thankfully, the mission does provide you with infinite ammo until completion, so that's nice. Ended up getting two stars and needing to take down a lot of cops along the way, but eventually, I completed it for... $50? Are you serious? That is not worth my time, holy crap. I can't remember what, if any reward there is for doing, say, all of the rampages, but if any of the others pay as badly as this one did, I probably won't be doing any of them. But I guess we'll see. Oh, and by this point, if you hadn't already noticed, I had all but given up on my role play of making Vic a more lenient guy when it comes to violence. I feel justified in my decision story-wise, though, because, as I've mentioned, he is a much bigger hypocrite than I ever realized before, so he probably doesn't actually care who he hurts to supposedly protect his family. I mean, he has pretty clearly demonstrated that himself without me needing to say so, but yeah, I'm just kind of back to playing it like any other GTA, which is at least quite liberating. Ever notice how this always happens to me? Not sure if it's just because of the fact that I'm recording these missions, and thus feel a bit more on the clock, but yeah. I always start out with the intention of playing things in character, but pretty quickly that becomes boring and limited, so screw it. What's our next mission? Well, since I was still in the trailer park, I decided to tackle another Marty mission, Waking the Neighbors. This one serves as our introduction to grenades and continues to ramp up the intensity of the game's first act. We have to destroy three separate vans belonging to the Cholos at three of their different businesses across Little Havana and Little Haiti. The game supplies us with ten grenades to do so, but you don't need to use them. All you have to do is make sure the vans get destroyed, thankfully. But I was feeling like a good girl, so I followed the rules and rolled up on the first group by running over the guards and tossing some pineapples. Uh, oops. Oh well, it was just Marty's car. Hey, please get out. This game is really bad at spawning new vehicles. Oh, thank God. On to the next one. The second one is more of the same. Run over the guards, chuck a nade, run like hell. But after the second one, they're on to me, as the game puts it, so I will start getting chased by the Cholos in their fancy yellow saber turbos. The final one is a lot more chaotic, and I miss the grenade throw like three times, but eventually I blow it up, and my own car again, just barely managing to avoid dying in the process. Well, that's another mission complete. So our next mission is technically for Phil Cassidy, though it might be more accurate to say it's done with Phil, but for Jerry Martinez. Since Phil works for Jerry still, and we work for Phil. At least for now. So, Jerry is continuing to sell the military's weapons to third parties such as the distinguished Mr. Cassidy for resale and extra profits. And so, for this mission, we need to accompany Phil to the most recent shipment and ensure that it makes its way to his compound safely. 
Before doing so, we first need to pick up a couple of Phil's buddies, whom he swears are good guys, but then it's off to find the truck and hijack it. The baddies in the back will try to shoot you down as you approach, but thanks to Phil's extra hands, it's a simple matter of taking it easy on the approach, and then once the gunmen are dead, theirs, not ours, we just have to block the truck's path and wait for Phil to commandeer it. The final part of the mission, then, is an escort section. Hooray! It's actually not that bad, so long as you fairly often look behind you to see when the enemies are on their way. That, and don't take too much damage yourself, since I don't think Phil's boys will actually follow you to a new vehicle if you lose the one that the game gives you, which also might be his sister Louise's. Not sure. But anyway, let Phil's boys do their job and make sure the truck doesn't take too much damage, and eventually, we all reach Phil's compound once again for a mission complete and a job well done. 500 bucks, not bad I suppose, but given all the money I made doing ambulance missions, which I then spent on expensive weaponry and most definitely not on Pete's asthma medication, well, it's kind of not much. But don't you worry... Eventually, we'll be making more money than we could possibly ever spend. Just you wait. Next up, I headed off to do another mission for Marty J. Williams, but oh my, did I ever encounter some frustrations along the way. This one, Oh Brothel Where Art Thou, introduces us properly to a new mechanic in VCS, the one that will allow us to make a whole buttload of money very quickly, as I said just a minute ago. Vic will eventually be getting into the Empire business. For now, though, we need to help Marty do that by attacking one of the Cholo's brothels around the corner and then participating in a business takeover mini-mission. Thing is, in order to do that, one needs to first make their way over to the site unharmed and, holy crap, the game did not want me to do that this time around. So, before we head over there, we are also introduced here to the rather uncomfortably named and visually labeled Stonewall Jays, a sort of smaller mini ammunition that we can access earlier in this part of the game before going to ammunition proper. Although, as you've seen, you can already actually shop at, say, the ammunition downtown and buy most of the weapons, but they included this as, uh, now that I think about it, I'm not sure why they included it. I guess the main reason was so they didn't have to add an ammunition to this part of the map and explain why it isn't there in two years' time, because otherwise, players would have to constantly drive all the way downtown to get new guns. Stonewalls also exclusively sells only the Tier 1 guns, like the Stubby Shotgun and the crappy Scorpion SMG. So, yeah... It's a bit uncomfortable playing as a black man and then shopping in a place which not only has confederate flags all over the walls on the inside, but also uses one as its symbol on the map. And then again, Vic is also uncomfortably and reluctantly, I hope, friends with Phil, who himself is a fan of proudly displaying such a flag in his trailer just two years later. Not to mention the way that Phil treats Vic before learning that he's a fellow soldier... Anyways, once I finally got the stubby shotgun, which Marty pays for you to get at Stonewalls, I started to make my way over to the brothel, only to accidentally nudge a cop and uh, get arrested yet again. But I had spent all my money on getting shotgun rounds, so I couldn't afford to buy back my guns, and cheating or not, I was not about to deal with that bullshit. So I reloaded a save, as you do, the very same save that I loaded when I first started up this session. Yet somehow, when I went to start the mission again, it was a different mission. I was so confused. I'm still so confused. It was all off of the very same save state, so I have literally no idea how this happened, but whatever. I loaded the exact same save state one more time, and then went and did all of that one more time, 
being careful not to. Oh, for he hit me this time. Whatever. Buy my shotgun. Avoid the stupid cop outside. And then finally, finally drive to the stupid brothel. Here now, after all of that nonsense, we are properly introduced to the Empire Mechanic. There are a number of businesses owned and operated by three separate gangs across Vice City. The Bikers, the Cholos, and the Sharks. And I guess also Marty's gang for now. We can start a fight with any of them and initiate an attack on a business by blowing up their unique vehicle outside and then dealing with a wave of soldiers who pile out of the building to try and stop Vic. Once everyone is dead, head inside, kill the remaining dudes in there, and then destroy some of their equipment, and bam, the business becomes available for sale, and if you have enough money, you can buy it and convert it into a completely different type of the six available. Well, three initially, but six eventually. We'll get to that part a bit later, but yeah, for now... We just attack the brothel, defeat some cholos, kill the one dude inside guarding the place, destroy the one piece of equipment, which in this case is a bed because, you know, brothel, and voila, it's available to purchase, but as the game says, Marty's buying this one, so we'll get our chance a bit later. Mission complete. Well, because I want to get his missions out of the way as quickly as possible, I next decided to do yet another Marty mission in Got Protection. Now, for anybody who got the least bit defensive about me condemning the use of the Confederate flag a moment ago, yet actually continued to watch the video, first of all, good on you. Second of all, how do you square this in your head? During this cutscene, we get to see one of Marty's boys talk down to Vic and refer to him as a boy but Vic responds by showing he isn't the least bit scared of them. And the game itself goes out of its way to show that the loser trying to start something with Vic is just a coward who shrinks at the first sign of pushback from a man who is much tougher than he is. Their use of the flag, and for that matter, Marty and his entire redneck gang's use of the flag, is meant to make you hate them, make you realize that they are not worthy of anyone's sympathy, Certainly not in the context of this game, anyways. Whatever. Before I go on yet another self-righteous rant, let's get into the mission. Point stands, though. So here, we have to go right back to the brothel that Marty purchased at the end of the last mission, and when we arrive, a Cholo gang car drives by and tries to kill us. When they fail, we then have to jump into a four-seater vehicle and locate three girls around Little Haiti and Little Havana being attacked by the Cholos. Now, thankfully for them, as the first girl says, they've been given more than just rubbers for protection. So once we collect the girls, they will aid in shooting down the Cholos attacking each of the subsequent girls. So it's a simple matter of driving to each of them, taking out the two Cholos, and then not getting blown up on our way back to the brothel for yet another mission complete. You know, it's something I'm realizing kind of only just now, and I'm sure it has something to do with my familiarity with the games and their mechanics by now, but throughout the whole series, with the exception of maybe GTA 1 and 2 because of their clunky-ass controls, there are quite a few missions which are honestly kind of stupid simple in both premise and execution. I'm not necessarily complaining yet, I don't think, but yeah, just an observation and one that I remember making a lot in my last Game Vault episode on a game much later into the series, Ballad of Gay Tony. So yeah, a lot of GTA missions, especially in the early parts of the game, are just stupid, easy, and simple. A bit randomly, after that, I decided I was going to test the limits of my patience by trying the Vigilante missions again, but without what I would normally use, a tank or hunter helicopter. Now, this was primarily because VCS can be absolutely brutal. You can go from full health to full dead in the space of less than a second, I swear, so 
having even the tiniest advantage from getting extra armor could honestly be the difference between failing a mission and having to redo it. However, I am a dirty, dirty cheater, so... Yes, berate me all you want, but had I not used the amazing power of safe states to do these missions, it likely would have taken me ten times longer, and I am not exaggerating. Most of the time when the cops chase you in VCS, they spawn in at much lower rates than the other games. But just in general, VCS is one of the most chaotic in the whole franchise, and also the one that seems to have random crap that is almost never good for you happen the most. Did, did that English... that English, right? Look, the point is, all GTAs are crazy, but VCS can often make the other games feel tame. I'm not entirely sure what it is. The crazy fire rate of all automatic weapons, the speed at which NPCs will ram you with their vehicles, or just the fact that it was the last 3D era game and they no longer gave a single crap. But this game, especially when dealing with the cops and hostile NPCs, can just become overwhelming. More so than any of the other entries in the series, I think. It's just nuts. Like any other instance of doing Vigilante in the 3D era, though, the worst thing, the biggest threat, rather, isn't the NPCs you're hunting down, it's the other cops. Since, you know, you're doing Vigilante work. Strictly illegal crap. So at some point, the cops will start hunting you down when they witness you gun down several people in the streets or start lobbing grenades like it's nobody's business. Understandably so. I only happen to know where one of the wanted star bribes was, though, and one thing I have neglected to mention thus far is that unlike in the past, every level of any side activity only ever has a maximum time allowance of five minutes. In the past, you would gain time when completing objectives, and often could accumulate a 10 plus minute timer, and be able to start taking your time as the levels got more and more insane. Here, completing a level resets your timer to 5 minutes, which means no matter what you're being asked to do, that's all you ever have. So, taking some of that precious time to, say, find a normal car, and hit a pay and spray, or hunt down a wanted level star bribe can be a bit too tedious and even riskier than it otherwise would be. So the long and short of it was that as I went through the levels, I just had to deal with more and more and more cops until I had a four star wanted level during the last few levels, forcing me to rely on those good old safe states more and more. The first 10 levels, I barely used them, but those last five, oh boy, that got pretty intense, but eventually, magically, I managed to pull it off with the power of cheating. And, you know, now that I think about it, I could just use save states to get through the missions that would otherwise slow me down, and thus I could have just not gotten the extra armor, but no, if I fail a mission, I'll take the loss and restart as intended. Probably. Uh, but if I had resetted this every time I actually died, it would have taken me literally days to complete, and honestly, I don't think I would have had the patience to do it until I did unlock the tank or hunter, which wouldn't be until the end of the game, and thus it would be practically pointless. At least it's out of the way now. But I didn't jump right back into missions this time. No, instead, I decided to knock out another of the side activities, one of the more pointless ones, but I will take any advantage I can get in VCS. So it's time to be a firefighter and recreate that Denzel Washington movie before they actually finish the remake. Even though, you know, uh, that movie didn't actually have anything to do with fire, it was more metaphorical, but... Whatever. Let's go spray some people with a big hose. Now, unlike Paramedic or Vigilante, these missions are basically the same as they ever were. The timer accumulates time as you complete missions, and you just gotta drive around putting out vehicle fires 
and then people fires when they exit their burning cars. This is stupid easy, especially in comparison to vigilante or even paramedic. In fact, you can pass a level even when some of the people burn alive. You just lose a bit of time and, since the timer acts like in the old games, pretty quickly that becomes a meaningless loss. It makes me wonder if you could literally just finish the last few levels by showing up and killing everybody instead of saving them. I'm guessing not, but the thought of it potentially being possible does amuse me. So don't ruin this for me if you know the answer. Anyway, 15 levels later and I was completely fireproof. Now it's time to go back to missions. Off we go. So I returned to see Mr. Phil Cassidy for yet another mission tied to Jerry Martinez. Turns out recently, Phil got drunk and ended up talking some trash to Martinez, telling him that he was an asshole and this and that. Well, Jerry never liked Vic and now he's done with Phil too, so he sends us on a job to check out a warehouse of his merchandise and make sure it's all there. But to absolutely nobody's surprise, except I guess Phil and Vic's, when we get there, several men working for Martinez try to kill us. Well, luckily, Phil had loaded his last moonshine batch into the back of the truck, so as we drive away, he starts tossing the bottles like they're Molotov cocktails. You know, it says something that the stuff that Phil drinks is quite literally explosive and highly flammable. I'm not sure what it says, but... It's something. Now, VCS has a very low draw distance. So as soon as I get away from the initial ambushers, as long as I stay on the main road along the side of the mainland, they quite literally cannot catch us. That initial scramble to escape, though, was quite fun, with Dio's Holy Diver starting right as we made our escape. So it was a brief, if appropriately epic end, to a mission thread, since now, Martinez is openly hostile to both Vic and Phil, and Phil decides it would be a good idea to lay low for a while. Well, it's almost time to get into the Empire stuff. Now that that's done, we just have a few more missions for Louise first, before we get to do the GTA thing of taking down a former mission giver. Not Martinez, oh no, not yet. But I'm sure, if you've been paying attention, you can guess who. So I go to see Louise, and she's a bit distraught. Turns out she somehow only just now realized that she left some of her daughter's things back at Marty's. So it's up to Vic to help retrieve said things and deal with Marty should he show up to interfere. Well, he doesn't, but a bunch of his buddies do. In fact, the cutscene lays out that these guys are actually the other racers from the quad bike race, who are a bit butthurt over having been beaten. So it turns violent. Of course it does. Now, this is quite funny because once the initial pack are dealt with, I just start shotgunning the new ones that spawn in from a distance. And the literal second that one goes down, the other spawns in behind me, so I just do like six double takes and kill a bunch of goons, and we're good. Louise retrieves her baby's stuff, but also takes Marty's wallet, you go, get that bad girl, and then all we gotta do is drive Louise back to her sister's. Now, some of Marty's goons show up in trucks to pursue us about a block away from our destination. They don't even get the chance to ram us or shoot at us once. I don't know if this is a scripting error or what, but it was so completely pointless. I almost wonder why it was even programmed. Anyway, the next mission is a big one, story-wise anyway, so let's just jump right into it. Alright, here we go. The first game changer. Literally. Marty, as it turns out, was none too happy about being robbed, so he kidnapped Louise, and presumably her kid too. It's never quite clear, and we have to go save her. But the way that we learn that this happened is through finally meeting Louise's sister, Mary Jo. And let me just say, the way that Mary Jo is portrayed makes me so uncomfortable. Her entire character is... Well, she's a bigger woman, and so therefore she is perpetually obsessed with other men giving her the attention that her sister gets because she's skinny. So she worries more about Marty not having kidnapped her 
than the fact that her actual sister's been kidnapped. This will come up again during her only other appearance, too. It's just so gross that some man wrote this 20 years ago, and it was just completely acceptable to make this one-note joke of a character. Disgusting. Now, based on what we're given, Mary Jo is truly an awful person, but honestly, as much as I like Louise because we actually get to spend time with her, she isn't actually any better. In fact, the lack of actual due diligence she pays when it comes to her daughter's safety makes her a lot worse, in my opinion. I will remind you that she once left her literal baby daughter home alone while she went to ride quad bikes, and presumably also get drunk. Mary Jo is at least concerned for her sister's safety, even if her priorities are so messed up that she takes the time to hit on Vic and worry about not being perceived as attractive. Anyway, that's it. Mary Jo's writing makes me cringe. On to the mission. Well, we just gotta head over to the trailer park again and find that Marty is planning to literally turn Louise into a prostitute for having the nerve to, you know, be her own person and not take his awful abuse. He drives away with her in his truck, and then I have to contend with more white trash goons for a bit until hopping into the only vehicle available to me to chase after them. A literal bicycle. The thing is... GTA logic works in my favor this time because, for whatever reason, bike tires cannot be popped. Which means, as long as I can actually catch up to Marty, I am in an advantageous position to take out his tires. Now, unlike the last mission, the goons do show up to try and stop me, and because I'm on a bike, I do take a bit of damage. But once all of the tires on Marty's truck are popped, he gets out and it's a quick battle of the shotguns until he goes down permanently. Luckily, we were also right near the pay and spray though, so I'm able to fix the tires nice and quick and then just drive Louise home for a mission complete. Simple, cathartic, but plenty of fun. Oh, and we end the mission by driving Louise to Phil Cassidy's compound in the original VC. Yeah, there's no explanation of why we come here or how Vic takes control of it, but yeah, this is his now. Neat. Alright, now the real fun begins with the next and final Louise mission. In this one, Louise gives Vic an idea for solving both of their money troubles, take over Marty's former businesses. In fact, Louise is the entire driving force behind Vic doing it at all. He doesn't even seem like he wants it, or like he thinks he can handle it, but Louise believes in his, uh, violent and criminal nature, I guess? So, first we have to head over to, for some odd reason, the Sunshine Autos lot, but not the big fancy one from the original VC. That's still under construction and will be built on the site of the former trailer park. For now, it's more like a used car salesman lot, and for reasons the game leaves unexplained, there are two dudes chilling there who are easily and immediately interested in helping Vic to take over Marty's former empire. Then we just gotta head to his first business, the loan sharking place, and take out everyone in front. And then finally his second business, the Protection Rackets HQ, and do the same. Then just head inside, kill two more goons, and boom. Now the Empire Mechanic is finally available, and this, this is where the real fun begins. Well, I tend to really enjoy this part of the game anyway. This is a bit like the Gang Warfare Mechanic from San Andreas, combined with the businesses in the original VC, only this time... You get paid regularly without having to manually go to each business to collect the money, and you get quite a bit of freedom to customize each of the businesses by type. You can also upgrade them, and trust me, eventually, I'll be rolling in cash, so much so that paying for ammo or unique vehicles will be as easy as pie. So, naturally, after that mission it was time to take over every single business on the mainland. Just because I can. Well, maybe not quite take over everything. Not right away, anyways. 
See, now I have the ability to trigger a gang fight at any of the other businesses across the mainland. After blowing up their gang car outside, a whole lot of goons will pour out of the building, seeking my blood. In the case of the Cholos, this means a bunch of guys all swarm me with baseball bats, and it honestly becomes hard to even get a few shots in. I ended up almost dying and retreating to a nearby alley to exploit the AI's pathfinding and take them all out one by one. But once that's done, I still have to go inside and take out a couple more. Well, for these small businesses, it's only one more, but there's also some equipment you need to destroy to finalize the takeover. Then you have to actually buy the business, because if you don't, the ones you attacked, or even another gang, will eventually buy it themselves. So you have to make sure to only trigger attacks when you actually have the money to buy it. The cheapest business of the three available at the onset is the Protection Racket, but you can also upgrade it to levels 2 and 3 to have it make even more money, thus making your ability to buy even more businesses a little bit quicker. So I could save scum to take over the whole island nice and quick, but I haven't yet decided if that's what I'm going to do. Part of me also wants to spread out the takeovers across the rest of the game for narrative and entertainment reasons, which might also be fun, but we'll see. Took over one more site after that, which was simply up for sale and not owned by anybody. I do think it's possible for that to just happen from the other gang fights in the city, but I'm not sure. And after that, I ran out of money and decided to try the only mission currently available to me, and one that I've been putting off because I know it can be very annoying. Jive Drive. So here we go. We are finally introduced to a character who any players of the original VC are already familiar with, and who you might have guessed would eventually be in this game by the protagonist's last name. It's Lance. And frankly, Philip Michael Thomas's return here is one of the best parts about VCS because he always brings his A-game. Now, unlike the Lance we see in the original VC, which is actually two years after this, this version of the character has only ever had glimpses of that violent criminal life, at least so far. But here, here he gets fully introduced to it by none other than his self-righteous brother, because as soon as we pick him up from the airport, some cholos show up to assassinate Vic, and it turns into a drive across town while we shoot out the attackers pursuing us. This mission also confirms that we were supposed to have kept the car that Martinez gave us earlier, because Vic will magically have it once again when the cutscene starts, though it isn't long for this world. So this first part of the mission isn't very long, but the guns in VCS, oh geez, the automatic weapons in this game are so, so goddamn strong, and particularly when fired from inside of a vehicle for some reason. They all fire so fast, they might as well be mini Gatling guns, and even the low tier ones can do so much damage so quickly, it's actually ridiculous. Now, when originally recording this mission for footage, back in the day, this mission probably took me three or four tries just because of this initial section. But this time, I was at least somewhat prepared for the onslaught that was to come, and was able to survive it the first time around. We do a crazy jump at the end, and the car explodes, and then it's a matter of taking out the final wave of cholos and escaping. Problem is, like I said, the guns are so damn strong. One minute, Lance can be full health, and the next... No, no, no. One second, he'll be full health, and... Uh, and then he's dead before you even get a chance to glance at the health bar. I ended up failing one more time in this section, but this time because I died, not Lance. But third time's the charm, and I managed to chase down all the cholos and keep my dumbass brother alive long enough for us to make it to one of the Cholo's cars and drive away. Drop Lance off at his expensive-ass hotel that he is apparently billing us for, and that's a mission complete. Oh, and would you look at that? Payday, too. Then it was on to a new mission thread for yet another returning character. This time, Umberto Rabina. Now, in the original VC, Umberto certainly had some... 
well, insecurities about his masculinity. But in this game, he is kind of the template for Brucey Kibbutz from GTA 4. Literally everything he says and does is a homophobic joke about how, haha, Umberto is secretly into men but presents as hyper masculine. Isn't that hilarious? Ahem. <laughs> oh, yes. So very, very funny. Even the mission title is a joke in that regard. It's called Nice Package. Here, we have to prove ourselves to the leader of the Cuban gang, who used to work in some capacity with Marty. So we have to take one of the Cuban gang cars and go with one of their men to collect some kind of package. It's not entirely clear what that package is or why we're doing any of this, but the stated goal is to prove Vic's competence in order to forge a new alliance between the Vance crime family and Umberto's Cuban gang. So first, we have to get our hands on this package and then bring it to a drop-off location all the way across the map. I also think there's something here about being the ones to hold on to the package for the longest, but maybe that's just me remembering wrong. I don't actually know if it's possible to reach it before it gets collected, but this time, and as usual, another Cuban named Hilberto collects it, and then we have to literally murder him, take it, and drive it back. Now, I did lose both my car and the guy with me while doing this, which I thought for sure would fail the mission, but nope. So I just hopped into a nearby police car and raced all the way down the main road with no resistance for yet another mission complete. Hooray! Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, but just before starting this one, I also took over yet another business, one of the bikers' businesses. And as far as I know, these are supposed to be the same biker gang guys that Tommy Versetti works for or with in the original VC under Big Mitch Baker. I don't know if he's actually in charge now, though. Not that it matters. So, in addition to taking over businesses and getting to choose what their type is and upgrading them, each business in the Empire system also has a series of radiant mini-missions that you can tackle, so I decided to do the ones for the protection racket. Now, completing these boosts your income in that specific business type a little bit, but they're also just kind of fun to do. Not terribly complicated, but a nice, simple way to get your GTA fix. Each business can have a total of 15 missions done to boost your reputation for it, and like I said, the money that you make. Now, for the protection racket, this means we get to actually see why VCS included so many seemingly random shop interiors spread around the entire city. Because here, you'll have to drive from store to store, sometimes intimidating the store owner by smashing up their inventory and then fighting off a few of the gang members who show up to defend it, and other times rushing to the defense of one of your existing stores and taking out all the gangsters attacking it. These aren't super complex, but honestly, they don't need to be. Completing all 15 for the protection racket barely took 20 minutes or so, and if you put on some tunes while you do it, it's a nice alternative to just rampaging or driving around the city. You also don't need to start each new mission in between completing them. They just string together in a sort of infinite mission, going from one objective to the next. I rather enjoy doing this, and I'll definitely be doing this for all six business types, if only to unlock Vic's snazzy special suit, which you can only get by reaching the rank of ultimate badass, or like, top rank whatever, in all six. Well, one down, five to go. But more importantly, you don't get paid while doing these missions, and instead, any income just builds up so that when you do finish... Ah, you get one of those, and then you can use that money to continue your empire building. I love this mechanic, to be honest. Now, once you do start doing this, though, you can also have your businesses around the city randomly attacked, like the gang territories back in San Andreas. This can be any of your businesses, too, so sometimes they are just so far away that you will literally have no chance of actually reaching it in time. The only way to stop all attacks is to take over every business, but sadly, that won't be possible until we at least unlock the second island. That is coming soonish, though. Soon. So, screw it. Next, I decided to also tackle all the Empire missions for my second business type, Lone Shark. 
I did these from the place that we take over from Marty, though, nearby the trailer park and Vic's first apartment. Turns out this location is absolutely ideal for doing these missions. Either that, or these missions in general are even easier than the protection racket ones. Literally all these were, were either repossess a single motorbike by shooting the driver and sometimes the passenger off, and then drive it back to the depot, or repossess a truck full of merchandise by shooting at it a bit so that the driver runs away, and then drive it back to the depot. Thing is, that's it, and every single one of these spawned so close to the depot that I often didn't even need to use a car. I could just wait five seconds for them to drive right past, take the vehicle, and then deliver it. All 15 levels of this only took me like eight minutes. I did notice that when attacking the vans, the tires would pop on the truck even when I didn't shoot anywhere near them, but not like always. And at least occasionally, the bike driver would get off and take a few shots at me, but otherwise there was nothing to like actually do in these. The most interesting thing to happen was during one of the two times that I had to actually drive somewhere and only to the nearby airport. A cop spotted me trying to steal the van, which led to me having to take him out, and then another one, and pretty soon I had four stars. Thankfully, the spawning system in VCS meant that even this wasn't much of a challenge. And there just so happens to be a pay and spray around the corner from the depot, so after barely any effort at all, I had reached the max respect for another business. Turns out they aren't just all called Ultimate Badass, though. This one was called the, like, Crim Reaper. <laughs> nice. Back to missions briefly. Next, we have one that is started at Louise's place, but really it's more like a Vic mission, dealing with more Empire stuff. Hose the hose. Nice. Now, this one can be particularly annoying. Turns out one of Marty's cousins set our only prostitution business, one that Marty set up, I'll add, on fire. So we gotta grab a fire truck and put out the fires. Literally. Thankfully, Louise was either paying attention and saw a fire truck drive by her apartment, like, minutes before this started, or she's just a major rubbernecker and was, like, listening to a crime scanner for messed up reasons or something. I choose to believe it's the former. Time to see if those firefighting missions that I did earlier trained me well enough for this. As it turns out, no, no they didn't. See, this mission has a very tight timer, and as soon as you get to the cat house, you have to put out the fires on two vehicles in front of the building, lest they explode and make everything worse. Well, during firefighting side missions, you barely even have to aim at the cars. You just have to have your hose pointed, like, in their general direction and hold down the fire button. Ironic. But here, I'm not sure what they want from you. I tried everything, and no matter what I did, the cars exploded. And so I ended up losing this one the first time, which pretty much always happens. However, now I already had access to a fire truck, thus saving me just a few precious seconds. The cars both still exploded, but I managed to put out the fires in time. Then Louise points out that for some dumbass reason, the arsonist responsible... Marty's inbred cousin is standing right outside, and we have to chase him for all of three seconds and take him out for another mission complete. Simple as hell. Speaking of simple as hell, next I decided to do the next Umberto mission, which is literally just called Balls. So Umberto demonstrates that he most definitely is not gay by harassing an actually gay woman and being just generally completely disgusting. Great to know he's supposed to be my ally. Well, my ally in game, because he certainly ain't an ally. Just great. And then for reasons that are poorly explained, we have to take two Cubans with us and go stop the Cholos from causing too much havoc around Little Havana. All this means is finding the various groups causing a ruckus and taking them out, but as it turned out, the hardest part of this mission was keeping Umberto's men alive. Sometimes you have to take out cholos just on foot, but other times they're in their cars, and once they go up in flames, 
I swear to God, they explode way faster than in any other 3D era game. So you got to be sure to get away from them as quick as possible, or your car will also go up in flames. And if you think the Cubans are fast enough to exit the car and survive the explosion, well, you thought wrong. Second try, though, I had learned my lesson and kept my distance when we were dealing with them in a vehicle. And boom, mission complete. Well, frankly, I was kinda already getting tired of Umberto's whole shtick. So, I decided to try and cap off his mission thread and just do the two remaining missions back to back. Next up was Poppy Don't Screech, in which we have to go and save Umberto's father, Alberto, by picking him up from the stadium downtown because some cholos are apparently on their way to... I guess kill him, but I mean, it's incredibly vague. The whole premise is kind of super silly, but whatever. Anyway, once we get there, we have to collect the Elder Robina and then make our way to the cafe, the place where you take missions for Umberto in the original VC. But the catch is, we have to get there without ever driving too fast, crashing too hard, or being spotted by any other cholos, lest they attack. Any of these things will cause Alberto to have a heart attack and keel over right inside the car. Now, in the past, I have definitely had some trouble with this mission, but this time, I finally discovered there is a super easy way to get it done. Now, I've always started by driving off behind the houses here, but I always assumed at a certain point you just had to get back on the street and take your chances with the patrolling cholos. Turns out, nope. You can just be careful and stay off of the roads completely the whole way to the cafe, and thus never even run into the cholos. As long as you take it easy, the whole mission is a breeze. So that's another mission complete, and the next mission for our Cuban friend is his last one, so let's jump right into it. So this is the big one, so to speak. At least it's more involved and complicated than anything we've done so far for the Cubans. Havana Good Time, which is a fantastic title, I must say, sees us attempting to put the Cholos completely out of business by helping the Cubans attack their warehouse in Little Havana. So two groups of Umberto's men head out to the location, but first, we have to clear the way for them. We head over and take out the guys immediately guarding the place, and then the Cubans start to load up all the Cholo's stolen guns into two separate vans, while we defend them. At first, the Cholo's literally show up one at a time and it's ridiculously easy, and then all of a sudden they show up basically all at once, and things do actually get kind of intense for once. Not intense enough to truly worry about, but still... I did actually have to kind of pay attention to complete this one without any of Umberto's men being killed. The Cholos come from one of three different directions, so you do kind of got to have your head on a swivel once they show up in full force. Then all that's left is taking the second van and driving it back to Umberto's house, while a few remaining enemy gang cars pursue me. Once we deliver it though, we get our obligatory big explosion cutscene, which every game in the series has to have at least one of, and then, at least narratively, the Cholos are considered donezo. We've wiped them out. I'm not sure if they can even still attack our businesses. Probably, but this mission specifically is I think supposed to explain why they are nowhere to be seen in the original Vice City set two years after this one, since both of the other gangs in the game, the Bikers and the Sharks, are in the original VC. After that, I spent a little more time attacking biker businesses downtown and taking them over, but I like to upgrade them to the highest tier right away if I can afford it, which means I can usually only afford to do about two at a time, right now anyway, even with my paydays getting bigger and bigger. Something kind of annoying that seems like just padding is that when you attack a tier 3 business, you do have a few more enemies on the inside to contend with and a lot more on the outside, but you also have a bunch more merchandise you have to destroy which, in the case of the robbery business, just means having to run around the interior and shoot at an annoying amount of boxes. There's nothing challenging or interesting about it, it's just there to extend the time it takes to complete the attack. Not horribly annoying, but noteworthy for being a bit of a time waster. 
It will also become a lot worse once we get to the second island, if I remember right. Alright, next up, it's time to wrap up another mission thread, this time for Louise, with Robin the Cradle. So, a guy from Child Services tells Louise she's a bad mom, and that he's going to have her kids taken away. I mean, he isn't wrong per se, but his reason for doing so is because he just wants to sleep with her, so yeah. Big shock, but he's even worse than she is. However, Louise's idea of dealing with him was to send a group of presumably Vix thugs, or maybe just some of her own friends, to kill the man. Which, I mean, under other circumstances, sure. But here, well, as Vic points out, it isn't exactly going to make her look like a good mother when she hires men to kill people, so we're going to go and stop the hit. We find the guy being chased down the main road, and we just have to kill her attackers. Two guys in a truck, and be sure not to blow up their car too close to his, lest the explosions daisy chain. Once they're out of the picture, we just have to ram him enough to do damage to his car and make him get out and run away. Somehow, if this guy still works there, I have a feeling this would not necessarily work, but I guess if the guy's fear is that next time we will kill him, maybe that's enough for him to leave Louise alone. So anyway, mission complete, and that's the last mission we'll be doing for Louise directly, which means next, we'll be doing missions for our wonderful brother, Lance. So, the first actual mission done for Lance, or where Lance is considered the mission boss, as GTA defines it, is the audition. Lance is having a phone call meeting with an unidentified figure, and he promises that whatever he's got cooking, it will be very beneficial. Probably just to him, but Vic indulges him because family. So, we have to break into a compound and steal this contact's car back from a group of... I think shark gang members, but it's never fully clarified. The compound we break into is also the one from the finale taxi mission for Kaufman Cabs in the original VC, where you face off against the zebra taxi. In order to break in, though, we first have to use a bike to drive up some ramps and then leap our way inside, kind of like G Spotlight in the original, but a lot shorter. Then, once we drop down, we start getting shot at from all angles. From my memory of doing this mission before, the hardest thing here is just keeping Lance alive, but I take my time and exploit the fact that VCS has a pathetic draw distance, waiting until the enemies spawn in as far away as possible, and then gunning them down before they get much of a chance to even shoot at us. Once they're all gone, we hop into the car, and unfortunately, even more spawn in to make things a bit harder. Just jump the ramp to escape without taking enough damage to light the car on fire, and bam. We escape, and Lance takes the wheel, claiming that he needs to deliver the car personally since his contact doesn't know Vic yet. Vic suspects that the car was actually filled with drugs, and he apparently objects to that, but whatever. I mean, Vic is literally running a loan sharking and protection ring, so... He should just keep his damn mouth shut, but point is, mission complete. So Lance's contact is a man named Brian Forbes, and it's time to go work for him directly. Oh, also, he spells his name with a Y. I guess I probably shouldn't be one to talk, but still, that's weird. In this next one, Money for Nothing, we have to help Lance and Forbes collect a shipment of drugs and distract the police long enough for them to make a getaway meet them over by their van, and then drive over to their warehouse, where the real mission begins. Now, I do remember this mission giving me a little bit more trouble in my last attempts done on the PSP emulator. I don't know if that's simply because the police spawned in more frequently in that version, or what, but it doesn't really matter because by now, thanks to the mission Poppy Don't Screech, I have learned the most effective method to do this one is just stay off the roads. All you have to do is drive far enough away from Lance and Forbes, and then survive a timer until they deliver the goods. But if you just drive behind all the buildings, like I did during that Umberto mission, well, they literally can't do anything to stop me. They give me three stars, but the helicopter that starts chasing me, for whatever reason, in this game, doesn't seem to have a gunman that fires down at you. At least, not this helicopter at three stars, I guess. I think it's actually just a news chopper. 
But as long as you stay far enough away from the roads and drive carefully so as not to accidentally crash into the water, the mission is stupid easy. Then, once Lance and Forbes are safe, we just have to lose the cops by whatever means we want, since the van we're driving is just a decoy. So I continue to use the safe areas off to the side, and then once I'm nice and close to a pan spray, emerge to find that police are still barely an issue at all. It's funny because when they do show up, they're aggressive as all hell, but man, VCS's draw distance doesn't do its gameplay any favors during missions like this one. So that's another mission complete. After that, I decided to finally wrap up my empire business on the first island by taking over the three remaining businesses owned by the bikers downtown. Now, I was trying to avoid ever having any prostitution businesses, but in order to get the special pastel suit for Vic, you have to reach the highest rank in all businesses, so I decided to make just one of my businesses here a brothel, and then after I complete the missions, I'll turn it back into loan sharking. Eventually, I'm going to make all of them into robbery places anyway for maximum revenue, but not quite yet, so this will only be temporary. So as it turns out, if it weren't for wanting that stupid suit, which I don't even know why I'm bothering this much, well, I could have saved myself a lot of hassle because the brothel missions are more than anything else just kind of annoying. They're kind of like the same missions that you do of this nature back in San Andreas. You need to pick up two separate girls in this special vehicle unique to the business, which admittedly does kind of slap, and then bring them back and forth between clients, occasionally needing to take out a customer who refuses to pay, or worse, is a piece of trash that starts beating on one of the girls. Now the problem is, for one, the timer is super tight here. Like, you were just barely afforded enough time to complete these, so I ended up failing several times. Thankfully, when you complete a level or job in these missions, you automatically save your progress. So it's not like failing means you have to start all over from the beginning like it used to for other side missions in the other games. So I failed once because I wasn't fast enough. A second time because I accidentally took out one of the girls when trying to do a drive-by on an aggressive client. Ooh, that's not a good look. And then a third time because my car blew up, and unlike, say, Vigilante, you can't just swap it out for another car of the exact same type without having to go back inside the building and start over again. Other than that, it's basically just a more boring taxi mission with the occasional need to take out those aggressive clients. It was at least one where I got to stay in my car 99% of the time and thus actually get a chance to listen to a chunk of a radio station, Emotion 98.3 of course, but that's about it. I found these to be more annoying than I remembered, but it also probably didn't help that I chose the location that I did in downtown, where the roads are super inconvenient to navigate. Oh well, that's all three of the businesses currently available to me at max rank and pretty soon I'll be unlocking the other three. So shortly after the last mission for Forbes, Lance messaged us on our pager, saying that he was becoming suspicious of him. So he requested we meet up at the stadium downtown. Well, when we head over there, we find Forbes acting a little bit sus, as the kids say, and then Lance shows up to break the truth. Forbes has been a cop this whole time. Now, he claims that he just wants to work with Lance and Vic to make some extra money, and that he isn't planning on busting them, but having a gun put in his face makes him rethink his strategy, and before you know it, he's making a run for it, forcing us to give chase. Now, the game immediately supplies us with two possible choices for pursuit, a slow, heavier van, or a quick, lighter cheetah. But our goal here is to ram him until he gets out of the car, or so the game initially says. Actually, once we start ramming him, our money, apparently, starts flying out of the trunk. Our actual goal then becomes to stop Forbes and drag him out of the car before all the money flies away. Now, luckily for me, I ended up getting this done basically immediately, thanks to dumb luck and bad AI drivers. So then Lance suggests a location we can hold him while we figure out what to do next, and that's another mission complete. Alright, leap and bound. 
So now that we have Forbes tied up and hidden away in some random building, Lance starts to interrogate him in order to get information out of him or potential work to be found around the city involving the illegal drug trade. Or really just about anything. Well, it turns out Forbes knows that there is a deal going down today by the water, and the dealer apparently doesn't believe in bodyguards. Um, all right, that's a pretty bad dealer for sure, whatever. So Lance and I head off to meet them. Lance will do the talking and we'll watch from a nearby building to make sure everything is on the up and up. Well, surprise, surprise, it's not. And the guy ends up knocking Lance out and kidnapping him for reasons which are never explained. I guess maybe they know about Vic's own business empire and want to try and get information out of Lance about it, but I have no idea. Point is that now we have to chase them as they flee in a boat, but not using a boat of our own. No, instead we're meant to chase them along the waterfront in a scene that is, I believe, directly inspired by a chase in the early seasons of Miami Vice. I know which one they mean, and I can, like, picture it in my head, but for copyright reasons, I can't show it. And also, I have no idea what that episode actually was, and finding it would take me forever. Just trust me, it's true. Both the original VC and this game have a ton of Miami Vice references, not the least of which is the inclusion of Philip Michael Thomas to begin with. Anyway, the chase is slightly spoiled, by the fact that I have to listen to the unskippable news during the first leg of the pursuit. And once the news is finally over, the music isn't exactly fitting for a chase, but ah oh well, they don't go very far. They end up stopping at that one boat that you also have to infiltrate towards the end of the story in the original VC where the counterfeit plates are made, or something like that. So we then have to use a car to leap onto the boat, which might be where the first part of the mission's title comes from, the bound part, though, comes from once we get inside by going around the back entrance. We find Lance bound up and being interrogated much like Forbes was, but it's stupidly easy to shoot his attackers and then <laughs> leap once again down to free him. The baddies here all only have, like, pistols, which makes for a rather uneventful fight, but once Lance is free, we're not quite done yet. Then we have to head up to the surface and find some contraband, I guess to make this whole mess worth the time that we've spent on it. So there are a couple of packages up near the top of the bridge, or whatever you call it, guarded by more relatively incompetent guards. And then there's also a package all the way at the end of the boat, but for some dumb reason it's only after we collect all the packages on the upper decks that we are told there's actually a last package back inside. You know, where we literally just were. So then, for seemingly no reason at all, we have to load back into the interior, grab one more package right in the first hallway, and then load back out. What was the point of that? More filler, I guess. Whatever. All we gotta do then is leap off the boat to meet Lance, where we load up the product, and then he takes off without even offering us a ride home. Dick. Mission complete, though. Then I spent a little bit of time making sure all of my businesses on the mainland were at Tier 3 and loan sharking operations, which make more money than the protection rackets. Like I said, I don't feel super comfortable running like a dozen prostitution rings or, you know, any prostitution rings, so I'm just going to flat out avoid ever having any of those. If Vic can be a little self-righteous, then I most certainly can. I mean, I'm less of a hypocrite because unlike Vic... I have never killed anyone, as far as I know. Anyway, we've only got a few more missions to go until we finally unlock the second island, and soon, next perhaps, we'll get to meet Lance and Vic's mother. Oh boy. Actually, not quite yet. No, next we're going to wrap up the whole Forbes thread with the mission The Bum Deal. We continue to interrogate him, and this time, we get information regarding a supposed big deal going down at a nearby bar, the White Stallions. Well, the name should have been the first clue, but upon arriving, we learn that in fact it is a white power biker gay bar. Huh, not a combo one sees too often. And they aren't exactly fond of men like Lance and Vic, so as per usual, and this time for a very good reason, things get violent. We have to fight our way out of the bar, but 
Actually, I had taken out everyone in the front before we even went in, which I guess canonically, given the order of events, made me the instigator. Perhaps that's the reason they tried to have us killed, and worse. Either way, all the bigots get disposed of, and then we have to rush back to the apartment, only to find Forbes trying to make a run for it. Well, man needed to work on his timing because he's leaving right as we show up, and thus it turns into a very brief bike chase before I gun him down and wrap up that thread for good. But Lance continues to insist that the big deal Forbes was talking about might still be worth looking into. For now, though, since we have to drop Lance off at his hotel anyway, it's on to a mission that starts here as soon as I finish that one. Alright, so now we get to meet Lance and Vic's white trash mom, who arrives in VC seemingly for the sole purpose of exploiting the fact that her sons now run a criminal empire. She shows up with her newest boy toy, and looks to take the boys for all they're worth, though she swears this time she's off the drugs, completely, and then immediately asks for a drink. Um, alcohol is a drug, by the way. Anyways... Lance tells us that he's obtained information about that supposed big deal, and that to get it, we have to go meet his contact down at the airport. So, really, he doesn't know anything yet. Just that there's somebody down there who does. And of course, it's never quite as simple as go down there, get the info, and leave. Never. So, upon arriving at the airport to meet his contact, they say that actually it's first-come, first-serve basis. And well, he's already served up the information in question to a contact who is now boarding their private jet at a nearby terminal. So we're off to intercept them before they can take off, pun intended, with the information and leave us empty-handed. Now, I did remember having to restart this mission once or twice before, so I approached the plane very carefully, yet again exploiting the horrible draw distance in order to draw out every enemy and take them out as quickly as possible with a minimal loss of health and armor. Lance heads inside the plane to grab the file we're after, and while he does that, we have to hold up a group of four more dudes who show up to crash the party. Now, I'm pretty sure it's here that I died before because... You basically have to have a bit of a buffer to survive this encounter. You will get shot a bunch, and you just gotta be able to tank enough of the damage to take all of them out without dying yourself. Lance exit the plane conveniently only once all the hard work has been done, and that's it. Mission complete. And next up, I believe, is the mid-game finale, so to speak, which will finally unlock the game's second island. So, what are we waiting for? Alright, so from zero to hero. Turns out that big shipment that Forbes was going on about was one being brought in by none other than Jerry freaking Martinez. That fact alone convinces Vic to do it because he was otherwise getting sick of Lance involving him in the drug trade, which I guess might be the canonical explanation for why the player cannot have any of those types of businesses in their empire until after they've done this mission. So anyway, we take a few loyal goons, hop in a car, and then head down to the docks near the dump to find two trucks being loaded. We just gotta take out the guys guarding it, and then hop into the trucks ourselves. Upon doing so, V-Rock is scripted to start playing Holy Diver, and the fun part begins. Martinez shows up in a hunter attack helicopter, and several of his goons start chasing us in cars. So the goal becomes to not take too much damage on the way to the bridge, linking the mainland to the Vice Beach areas. This can be quite annoying since you're never really in an advantageous position to shoot back at the pursuing cars. You need to keep moving, and Lance is right in front of you. And since his truck is being driven by the computer, he just plows through anything in his way. At one point, I get pushed in front of Lance and he himself does a fair amount of damage to my truck, but once we reach the bridge, Martinez catches up. Crossing the bridge is a bit that I definitely remember screwing up in the past, but once you know what to do here, it becomes trivially easy, honestly. Martinez will shoot two or three barrages of missiles, but he also follows your path, so just do some simple serpentine, left, right, left again, and he can't get you making sure to turn as soon as he starts firing his barrage. We cross the bridge, crash through some cops, who also scare off Martinez from continuing to engage us, 
because I guess he thinks they won't have seen the freaking attack chopper firing missiles onto the public road. Sure. And then it's a mostly uninterrupted drive over to Lance's new place at the end of Ocean Beach. Despite having four stars. But luckily, Lance being in front does help with the one police blockade that we run into. But once we arrive, they all give up. No police shootout, nothing. Because cops in GTA operate on like mid-2000s gamer logic of, well, they made it to their new place alive, guess that means it's fine now. Anyway, mission complete. The second island is now unlocked. Woo! In the three years I've been doing this channel as my full-time job, I have received numerous offers for sponsorships from various sources. However, not once have any of them felt like both something that I would be proud to endorse, as well as a service that I myself would actually use. Until now, that is. With one of, if not the, most important election in American history coming up very soon, it is more important than ever to be aware of the news cycle and the biases of what articles your phone or other services are feeding you. And let's be honest, it's probably mostly stuff that you already know or agree with, or it's stuff that's specifically designed to manipulate and distort your perspective on often very important issues. I imagine lots of you already know where this is going, so yes indeed, today's video is brought to you by Ground News. Ground News is a wonderful and almost essential resource in today's highly partisan political environment. Every single news story you consume is usually trying to convince you of a specific narrative they have in mind, and sometimes those narratives may be more insidious and harmful than you realize. This is where ground news comes in. For just about any article on any subject that you come across, you can search it up on ground news and get a detailed breakdown of exactly what sides of the political spectrum are covering it, and even see what kinds of organizations are funding the outlets distributing those articles. Transparency is the name of the game, and when you use Ground News, that's exactly what you get. Whenever I see an article that grabs my attention now, I pop its title into Ground News and have a look at how other outlets are covering the same story to get a better overview of where it's coming from and why it's being shown to me specifically. If you care about integrity and transparency in the media we use to consume information in this highly divided political climate, Ground News is where you should be. And so they are offering you, my viewers, a special deal if you sign up at ground.news forward slash the criminal historian, which will get you 15% off any subscription plan they have available. I will continue to be highly skeptical of any and all promotion offers that I get for this channel, but I hope that those of you who have been here a while know that when I endorse something, it's because I am actually using it myself and find it to be truly valuable. One last time, that's ground.news forward slash the criminal historian for 15% off any plan. Also, a huge thank you to all of my wonderful YouTube members and my patrons at Patreon.com. An extra special thank you to my executive producer and Walkerville tier supporters, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Dicastinator. Supporters at these tiers also have the option to promote a little bit of their own content. So, this video is also brought to you by Mason Collins podcast channel, We Are About Everything, Chuck K45's Upstart Farming channel, and Diecastinator's channel all about diecast cars. I release all videos a little early to all supporters and give you access to any of the original music tracks created for a given video. You'll also get to see your name in the credits of all videos that are produced while you're pledged. Get access to a small patron-only Discord where you can easily speak with me or see little behind-the-scenes snippets, and you'll receive my eternal gratitude. Seriously, especially these days, those of you who support my work directly are absolutely incredible, and I can't properly express just how grateful I am to you all. 
Sign up as a YouTube member today or get slightly better prices at patreon.com forward slash the criminal historian. Thank you. So with both islands now unlocked, I thought it was a good idea to just tackle all of the Empire business right away, or at the very least completely eliminate the most dangerous of the rival gangs, the Sharks. So I spent the next little while completely conquering Vice Beach, and luckily, when completing an attack on a business that's level 3, you earn enough money to immediately turn it into a tier 1 protection racket. Now, the sharks are particularly dangerous because they will ambush you in a truck with four guys all carrying the tier 2 submachine gun, and when all NPCs are in their cars still, well, these things can cut you down in literally less than a second from full health. It legitimately feels rigged because it's basically impossible to not get ambushed and killed immediately once you start attacking them, but since all it takes is one attack on one of their businesses to trigger them, it's best to get it out of the way early, so that later on you're not attacked right before starting a mission, for example. Now, unfortunately, you cannot actually take over all businesses quite yet, as there is one biker place that is taken over as part of a mission, so the vehicle will not spawn outside of it, allowing you to trigger the attack. This also means that even after clearing the sharks, you can and will still be ambushed rather often by the bikers, so, in hindsight, it may have been a better idea to not tackle any businesses until doing that mission, but oh well, too late now. Let's try and get to that mission as quick as possible now, though, so we don't have to worry. Starting with our first one for Lance here on the second island, Brawn of the Dead. So, Vic calls Martinez to brag about having robbed him of an enormous shipment of coke, but to Vic's surprise, Martinez is more afraid than he is pissed. Not a Vic, no, no. See, Martinez did not own that shipment of snow, far from it. He was simply the middleman for a much more powerful organization, the Mendez Brothers. Losing the shipment to Vic and Lance means that he is just as much on their shit list as we are now, and so he plans to turn state's evidence and sell us all out. Well, Vic is none too happy about this outcome, but Lance blows it off as nothing to worry about. He says that all we need to do is sell the stuff, and then we'll have enough money to solve all of our other problems. And as it turns out, he's also already got a buyer lined up, a movie producer by the name of Spitz, and so it's time to go meet him and iron out the details. So all we gotta do is drive over to the North Point Mall to meet him, making sure to arrive before 4am since the Z-List movie he's filming only has permission to film at night. So our first goal, if you can even call it that, is to arrive before 4, but honestly, it's a two-minute drive, especially in Lance's new Silver and Furnace, which makes its first iconic appearance in this mission. So the only way to screw this up is blowing up the car or being a truly exceptionally bad driver. Well, I ended up being about two good crashes away from blowing up his car when we finally arrived, but I figure that the mission will auto-repair his car while we're inside doing what needs to be done, so let's go make a movie. Because while Lance is talking to Spitz about the details, he requires a stuntman for his zombie film, and so, in order to butter him up, Vic volunteers. Actually, Lance volunteers for him, but whatever. Point is that now we have to kill a whole lot of zombies in order to complete the mission. There are two objectives. The first one involves us being trapped in this kiosk with a shotgun, and all we have to do is keep shooting at the zombie stunt people, making sure not to let the gore meter drop in the allotted time. This is exceptionally easy, but still plenty of fun. All you do here is sit and tap two buttons, one to shoot and one to switch targets. You'll actually pretty quickly run out of targets since the shotgun's range isn't all that far, so sometimes you'll have to be crazy and use a third button <gasps> to target new ones, but otherwise it's practically impossible to actually fail this part. The second objective is failable though if you don't pay enough attention. 
Here, you have to stop the zombies from entering a record store on the second floor, and you're given a katana to do so. So it's a simple matter of running around stabbing them, while making sure to always double back and check the door, lest some sneak in from the side while you're out doing your best Frank West impression. But luckily, the timers aren't very long, and this second objective is just engaging enough to require your attention. Once both are completed, Lance seals the deal, and then we just gotta drive home to pick up the product that we're going to sell to him. Problem is, when we get home, a small detail is revealed that, well, changes things. Turns out, though unspoken until now, Vic and Lance's mother, the coke addict, moved in with them into Lance's new fancy house at the end of Ocean Beach. And for whatever reason, they also made the genius decision to leave her and their enormous shipment of coke alone together. And surprise, 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 it's gone. As is she. Well, that's quite a predicament, but mission complete. Yay! It was after completing a mission on the second island that I realized something. I could now get my health upgraded since the air rescue missions should now be available from the downtown hospital, so that's what I did next. Now in the old games, the way to upgrade health was usually to do a pizza delivery job, but this I suppose does make a little bit more sense, I guess. All these missions are, are a flying version of the ambulance slash paramedic missions, which ultimately means, well, they're just really tedious. You have to fly around the entire city, dealing with the annoying load screens that accompanies going from one side to the other, and spend about 90 solid minutes just flying around. I normally quite enjoy flying in these games, but doing so for this amount of time, with a little challenge or variation, well, it got pretty boring pretty quick, but goddamn if I didn't need that health boost, because it very well may make the difference between success and failure in some of the game's harder missions coming up. Now, something that's rather annoying that I didn't realize until, like, level 14 is that your helicopter is capable of carrying four people, not just three like the ambulance, which makes sense if you look at the device you're using to collect them. Oh, and side note, this is the worst air rescue I've ever seen. The people you save have to hold on to this, like, flotation device thing using just their upper body strength while you fly them across the entire city to collect other people. Like, nope, just let me die, thank you very much. So yeah, this is super easy and not at all challenging, just very, very long. Like I said, it took me about 90 minutes to complete. Now, the other challenges sometimes took that long too, but there's something more engaging about driving, at least in these games, than flying, which never throws any punches or has anything particularly interesting going on. Fly here, fly there, drop off the patients, done. Whew, at least I finally have the extra health now. But it was around this time that I came down with a bit of a head cold, so I didn't feel like doing regular missions, and instead... I thought it would be a good time to finish building up my empire to maximize profits before I take over that last business in one of the Mendez brothers' missions. So first, I spent a bunch of time using the money I'd accumulated while doing air rescue to upgrade almost all the businesses I had in the Vice Beach area to Tier 3 robbery places. Then it was a matter of completing six separate mini-missions in order to reach the highest rank and Screw it, I'll probably do this for all the remaining businesses, just so that Vic can wear that snazzy teal suit for a majority of the remaining mission cutscenes. Now, each of these did have some rather simplistic explanation of exactly what was going down in these little cutscenes in engine that they start to play for you, but I wasn't feeling particularly invested, so I skipped them all, and surprise surprise, I'm not missing much. In fact, these are set up to look like each is unique, but in reality, all but one of these was basically the exact same mission. Find an enemy vehicle roaming around the city, and do enough damage to force the drivers out without destroying the vehicle. Then steal it, and make it back to your businesses while NPCs try to stop you. Sometimes cops, usually just other robbery outfits, I presume? The one that was different and actually a bit interesting 
was the one that sent me out to the water to do the same thing, but with boats. Now see, in the original VC, this would have been awful, but being able to actually swim made these particularly interesting. With boats, you can exit the driver's seat and still shoot your weapon, you can dive into the water if your boat catches fire, and it all just makes for a rather dynamic, very Miami Vice-style mission. I kind of wish they'd done more of these kinds of missions in the main threads, but so far, we have had very few actual opportunities to use our newfound swimming powers. Eventually, though, I completed all six mini-missions, and then it was on to drug running. These are also all set up to be unique mini-missions with their own mini-cinematics, but once again, they're dead simple and all very much the same, for the most part. They either involve being the seller or the buyer, or kind of both. Either way, usually you drive to one spot, make a deal, and then usually escape an ambush by the cops or a rival gang to return the product back to your business. I would say these seemed a little more unique than the robbery missions, but still not exactly unique enough to feel worthy of going into detail for each one. Six missions later, and I only had one more business to reach the highest rank in. Time for some smuggling. So, smuggling missions also turned out to all basically be the same, despite being initially presented as though they were going to be unique. The ante does, I suppose, get ratcheted up a little bit with each subsequent level, but it isn't by much. So, all of them consist of going to a boat and then driving, uh, boating out to a helicopter hovering over the water, and then you either collect 15 packages all alone with no challenge, or you're forced to compete with several other smugglers to get 15 packages before they do. When the other smugglers come into play, you can just take them out, and more will not spawn, making it easy again, but those at least have a little bit of a challenge, albeit not a big one. Then, once you have all the packages, you drive to the shore, and the goods are transferred into a truck, at which point you just drive it back to the warehouse, or, after the first level, drive it back while being pursued by the authorities. Now, I expected the wanted stars here to be sort of semi-permanent, but nope. If you exit right at Colonel Cortez's docks, as I usually did, you're just a 20-second drive from a pay and spray that will completely remove the cops, and the stars do not, say, magically reappear after you lose them or anything like that. Then it's usually just a peaceful drive back. In the last mission, you also have to evade some hostile boats on the way back, and also collect 20 packages instead of just 15, but that's about as complex as it ever gets. And with those completed, I now have the highest rank in all of the businesses, which also means I have finally unlocked the best outfit in the game, Vic's Teal Pastel Suit, which is just flashy and 80s glam as hell. I love it. So at the very least, completing all of these means I'll be able to do the rest of the main missions in style. Speaking of which, let's finally return to actual missions for a while with another from the Lance Thread. So, after spending an hour or so upgrading all of my remaining businesses to Tier 3 Robbery for maximum profits, it was time to start the next mission, in which all of my businesses, apparently, are directly targeted by the Mendez Brothers. Actually, I've always kind of found this mission a little strange, since the game tells you that all your businesses are under attack, but you only actually have to defend one. And it's also the closest one to Lance's house in Ocean Beach. Now, the hardest part here is making sure Lance doesn't die as you hold off wave after wave of Mendez goons. But as long as you're careful when the one or two cars show up full of baddies, it isn't that bad. But Lance mentions in the ending cutscene that while we might have won here, we probably lost elsewhere. However, the game doesn't take this opportunity to, say, have a bunch of your businesses set to damaged, which seems like it was implied by the rest of the mission. Also, I'm starting to notice that cutscenes are chugging along a little bit more in the emulator, but I don't know if that's a pattern or not. I'm a little paranoid, though. Something that has prevented me from thoroughly enjoying the second half of Vice City Stories every time I've played it is the fact that, on emulators at least, the game seems to start lagging and slowing down a lot more 
once you reach the second island. It hasn't been nearly as much of an issue so far on the PS2 version compared to the PSP one, but, well, it does still worry me, and it can make some of the second half's very frustrating missions even more annoying to complete. Not to mention it butchers the otherwise fantastic soundtrack. Anyway, with this mission complete, the Mendez brothers contact me directly, meaning I can finally go meet our next pair of antagonists. So we meet the Mendez brothers. There's the one that talks, Armando, and our primary antagonist of the two, and the one that, well, technically Diego does talk, but he seemingly does not speak a word of English, only Spanish, and his dialogue is never translated by the game, so I have no idea what he's saying, and even then, he never says much. So Vic and Lance apparently agreed to meet them at their private mansion, and allowed themselves to be searched and disarmed. Basically served themselves up on a silver platter to the brothers, but luckily, they are apparently not interested in just taking out the competition, and instead offer the Vance brothers an opportunity to work together. But the catch is that they first need us to prove that their coke being stolen had nothing to do with us, and instead was the work of Jerry Martinez alone. Well, as it turns out, Lance actually has a good idea to do just that. See, this is where Forbes comes back into the picture. Well, his ID, anyway. We're going to take a couple photos of Jerry showing up and talking to the feds now that he's turning states, and then grab Forbes' ID, which Lance handily held onto, and plaster Jerry's picture onto them, creating a convincing fake. Well, first, we find Jerry down at the police station in Washington Beach and have to take the first photo. And then we have an annoying but thankfully very short tailing section as we follow him to the marina where he plans to make an escape under his new name, Sven Johansson. Take a second pick of him at the marina, and this time he sees the flashes, presumably, and so we have to then head to Lance's place with a four-star wanted level. I was going to lose the cops right away, just like I did for the smuggling missions that always started me off here at the marina with a bunch of heat, but I'm dumb and didn't realize the car that Jerry and the DEA agent had been taking was a police cheetah, and thus could not be sprayed. So instead, I headed to Lance's, grabbed the ID, and Lance's silver and furnace, and then I lost the cops at the pay and spray, and drove all the way over to the print works, where Lance has the forged papers printed up toot sweet. Mission complete. Hey, that rhymes. Next up, we have the mission I've been waiting for, which finally allows us to control all 30 business sites across the city. Hostile takeover. Now that we have a partnership, so to speak, with the Mendez brothers, they start giving orders to Vic. More specifically, Armando does. His first command is to take over the last remaining business owned by the bikers in Vice Point. I mean, he doesn't phrase it like that. He makes it sound like the Mendez cartel literally has no other venues for distribution and that taking over this one spot will grant them that. He also makes it sound like revenge for them working against the Mendez cartel's interests, which makes a lot more sense since, you know, we own the other 29 sites that have not been helping them either. So this ends up being a gauntlet of bikers, mostly. The place is crawling with them and they just keep spawning in, but thankfully they don't make us go inside. Instead, once most have been dealt with outside, a whole gaggle of them appear on their signature vehicles and start a little convoy. So then it's a simple matter of hopping onto one of the bikes that are outside and chasing them down. They don't get far, like literally less than 100 yards before the last one falls and boom, mission complete. Now, finally, this business becomes ours, and I can also upgrade it to a robbery to fully maximize profits for the whole empire. Also, apparently, all of our vehicles are now upgraded when we own all 30 sites, but the game makes it sound like that's something that we can lose, which I don't think that it is. Now that there's no more competition, attacks on our businesses should completely cease, which is the best reason for getting all of them in the first place. So now, for all intents and purposes, the Empire stuff is done. So let's continue with missions and finally go meet a new contact. And that contact is Rennie Wasselmeyer, who, 
Well, if you know anything about me, you may assume that I've got some opinions on them, and I most certainly do. However, I have already twice now made it pretty clear how I feel about them, so I'll very quickly summarize here, but if you want to go into details, watch my video on trans people in the GTA series, or my video on all queer representation across the whole series. Both should be linked in the description, assuming I remembered to do that, that is. Anyway, the thing to know is that while I don't love the portrayal of Rennie, and overall I think that the portrayal is based in negative stereotypes that themselves hindered my own ability to accept myself, the actual character of Rennie I quite enjoy. They're just so lovable, if a bit handsy. Certainly not a character whose actual personality I would declare immune from criticism, but I feel like my appreciation of Rennie is similar to the reasons that lots of queer folk, myself included, love, say, Frankenfurter in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, even if he is the villain and thus does some truly villainous things. Anyway, on to the actual mission. So, in case I didn't explain it before, we met Rennie because that movie director Spitz recommended we see them, since they are always in need of some product. You know, come to think of it, I have no idea how or why Spitz recommended us for anything because last I checked, we made a deal with him and then went to collect it, only to find it had all been stolen by Lance and Vic's drugged up mom, so I guess it's just kind of assumed that we somehow made the sale to Spitz at a later date using the other product Vic has coming in from his various businesses, in a scene that we just never get to see, I guess. Anyway, Rennie wants coke, and they want it now, but unfortunately our timing isn't amazing, as we learn that Rennie's current stuntman has just quit, and of course they thus need us to fill their shoes. And in exchange, they promise to connect us with as many buyers as we could ever need. So, it's off to the races. Actually, this mission is among the best in the whole series in my opinion, or at least certainly one of the best missions of this game. All we have to do is take a red stunt in furnace and drive through a course across the city, making sure to crash into as many other red in furnaces as we see for maximum Michael Bay explosions to sell the movie. So, turn on V-Rock, drive like there's no tomorrow, and don't worry because crashing into the Infernaces does no damage to your own, and boom, you got yourself one fun, action-packed, and cinematic mission. Albeit one that isn't very challenging, since the only ways to fail it are to not crash enough, which is hard, given how many other stunt cars they throw at you. Or to run out of time, I guess, which is also hard, because every car you hit adds time. You end the whole bit by driving up a ramp and crashing through a window instead of a building, but I find it funny that in the actual cutscene which triggers, your car hits the light pole, which would otherwise ruin the jump if you'd done it for real in gameplay, and not just in a pre-rendered cutscene. Anyway, that's another mission complete. So next on the list was one of those missions I definitely remember being rather annoying, and I know I've heard other fans echo this same sentiment. It's turn on, tune in, bug out. Which, incidentally, I always struggle to say. It's like a tongue twister. Anyway, we find out that the DEA has bugged Lance's place, and thus, probably all of our businesses and our suite at the Climanus too. Oh yeah, I guess I haven't mentioned it yet, but when we unlocked the second island, we also got a brand new shiny luxury apartment at the Climatist Suites near Washington Beach Fairground. Anyways, Lance once again actually has a good idea, and it involves taking down all of the police station antennas to save ourselves the trouble of needing to debug <laughs> every single Empire business. So we collect our first rocket launcher, which gives us eight shots and thus two that we can miss. So yeah, I'll buy a whole lot more of that, thank you very much, and then we have to rush over to the Washington police station and shoot down the first two antennas. Now, for each antenna you destroy, you get one star, and you have a total of six to destroy, obviously. I'm 99% sure that it's useless to use a pay and spray during this mission, though, but I didn't bother testing to confirm. 
So the reasons this mission can be obnoxious are pretty obvious. The cops can be an absolutely brutal and unpredictable factor. Now thankfully, it doesn't really become a dangerous problem until you're on your way to that last police station downtown when you have four stars, but you don't already know ahead of time, as I did, that you reach the last two by climbing up the back of the police station. You can very easily screw yourself on the streets trying to shoot down the last one. Once all six are gone, you then have to actually make it to a pay and spray alive. Or I guess you could also go to six separate Bribe Star locations, but that's way more tedious. Now I, once again, just barely made it, but a tip here is, when you have six stars, very few civilian and thus sprayable vehicles will spawn for you. So what I did was take the helicopter on top of the station, flew to a nearby Empire site, and used one of those vehicles to reach it, and then sprayed my car to lose the cops, and just barely lost them in time to complete the mission on the first try, which I was very grateful for since I definitely remember it taking me multiple tries in the past. Oh, by the way, you know how I said that when you control all 30 Empire sites, your businesses stop getting attacked? Yeah, I guess I remembered that wrong, because that isn't true. I had to rush over to defend one after this, I don't think you can completely lose your businesses though, so that's good, but still, annoying. Anyway, back to Rennie for another mission, which introduces us to, technically, a returning character from the original VC. One that actually had very little screen time in that game, but whose voice actor nonetheless returned for this iteration to help flesh out the minor role he played in the original. Colonel Cortez's right-hand man, Gonzalez. So, in this one, Colonel Cortez himself has not yet arrived in Vice City, and instead, Gonzalez is here to pave the way for his boss's arrival. So, he's hiring us, through Rennie, to help safeguard his and his colonel's shipment as they make their way from a port on the mainland to the docks at the other end of the island. The game supplies us with a Sea Sparrow, which is also armed with front-mounted cannons, but this is kind of a red herring. This mission ended up being really easy for the most part, because I'm actually pretty good at flying helicopters. If you struggle with flying, well, this mission could be one of the harder ones for you. All I did for the first three quarters of the mission was hover above Gonzalez as close as possible and face the same direction he is, and then the two guards on the side of your chopper take care of all of the attackers with very little problem. Gonzalez didn't even take any damage until the very end when the one helicopter shows up and I had to manually take it down using the Sparrow's cannons. I actually thought I had failed this mission despite how well it went up to that point because right as I was in the final stretch, my helicopter caught fire, forcing me to bail but thankfully it was close enough for Gonzalez to make it to safety and still finish the mission, which makes me wonder if that whole bit was scripted because otherwise that was just way too close for comfort and I got incredibly lucky. Next up, it was time to pivot back to the Mendez brothers with unfriendly competition. I'm noticing that despite having very good performances and potential from the Mendez brothers, or at least from Armando, all of their missions have very little dialogue and very short cutscenes with minimal explanation for whatever we're actually doing. Here, Armando simply says there is a rival drug running operation that he wants us to take down, so that's what we go do. Real simple. Now, I didn't remember this from the mission name or the cutscene, but I would eventually be reminded that this is another of those missions that can be really difficult, especially if you don't know what you're getting yourself into ahead of time. The first objective is easy enough. There's a house in Vice Point that has about five baddies that you have to kill. None of them pose much of a threat. In fact, I don't even get out of my car. The real hard part, and the part that made me remember just which mission this was, was the second objective. You have to take out another group of rival dealers over at some hotel, and when you get there, well, 
a freaking army of, for some reason, all female assassins, like this outfit had some kind of Charlie's Angels thing going on, comes out to kill you. So the key to survival here, because I have definitely failed this mission multiple times in past playthroughs, is to make good use of the target switching controls. Seems rather obvious in hindsight, but yeah, shoot, switch, shoot, and don't stop until you can't target anyone else, because almost all the targets here are armed with full M16s or M4s or whatever, the second tier assault rifles that I also have. Once they all fall, the actual dealer, who is of course a man, goes to try and run away with one last assassin on the back of his quad bike as he escapes. So give chase and take him out, but the final catch is that he will lob grenades at you from his bike for a little extra spice. He isn't that tough, and eventually he does go down for yet another mission complete. In case you haven't noticed, we've kind of entered the game's final third, where missions will start to become pretty consistently hardcore. However, this next one was a bit of a break and more fun than anything else. I won't even say the name as it spoils it a bit, but we meet with Rennie and they introduce us to some music manager named Barry. Barry is apparently in debt to some mobsters and is looking for some quite expensive bodyguards who also won't have any trouble keeping their mouth shut about potentially illegal business. Hence, who could be a better candidate than Vic? So, we have to first drive Barry over to a bulletproof limo, jeez, I guess pulling out all the stops here, and then we can finally go to pick up his client at that park near the Climb in a Suite in Washington Beach. Bloody hell, that nut has sent a goon! Good after me, silent! Get him, Vic! Look, Barry, when I agreed to play Vice City, I didn't expect it to be my swan song. It's no problem, mate. Just some nutcase trying it on. Hey, aren't you? Phil, mate. Phil Collins. Let's do the meet and greet another time, I. Come on! So yeah, literally Phil Collins is in this game, which I'm pretty sure I did mention ages ago, but yeah, here he is. And his incompetent manager owes Giorgio Ferrelli out of Liberty City, $3 million. So he isn't too keen on negotiation to get that money back, since Barry probably won't pay it back. So he takes his other option of literally trying to have one of the most popular musicians of the decade murdered. Nice. So we have to kill a goon squad that tries to kill Phil, the name of this mission, at the park, and then hop into the limo and get him safely back to his hotel, while being pursued by yet more baddies. Nothing too crazy in terms of difficulty, but still. I next headed back to see the Mendez brothers, or really just Armando since Diego is rarely actually involved in much, and he so graciously informs us of a situation that has him concerned for our safety. You see, Diego, definitely just Diego and not at all Armando, told the cops that a shipment of coke that has been impounded was ours alone, and not at all theirs, so now we have to go and retrieve it to save our own asses. Oh, how magnanimous, Mr. Mendez. Frickin' douche. Anyway, this mission is rather simple, actually. We have to retrieve a helicopter with a magnet attachment, and then get two separate crates from the police, returning them safely to a drop-off point by the airport. The first one is just sitting down by the docks, unguarded. But the second one is actually on the move, so we have to maneuver the magnet onto the top of the truck while the truck is moving. But once both have been delivered, the unidentified guy who we've been on the comms with says that now he's in trouble. So we have to rush all the way over to Ocean Beach and physically pick him up in his car as he evades the police. This also ended up being rather simple though especially since Vice City has so many long, relatively straight roads, which means it's a simple matter of lining ourselves up and then gently easing down to scoop him up. He has us drop him off at the car park nearby and boom, mission complete. So I know I said not long ago that the missions were all getting a little bit harder, but that isn't always true here in the game's final third. See, that last one for the Mendezes was simple 
And this next one, oh boy, is it ever simple, especially in this particular playthrough. See, as I was flying the helicopter I still had from the last mission, I landed in the middle of the golf course to do my first mission directly for Gonzalez, Homes on the Range. In this one, Gonzalez wants us to help him teach a man who betrayed him a hard lesson by hitting him with a golf ball as he's tied to a buoy out in the water. Thing is, all you gotta do is hit him and that's it. Now, in my past attempts, and I assume most people's attempts, when you miss, Gonzalez will then speak, allowing for a little bit of a back and forth as you learn more about him and how slash why this man Jesus betrayed him. However, this time I nail the green section in both the swing power and accuracy on the first try, meaning my very first shot nails the guy and that's probably the easiest mission complete of the game so far, so hooray. Back with Lance, he tells us that somehow our product is still frequently going missing and that the Mendez brothers, who are apparently our suppliers, are getting suspicious. Vic also mentions Louise for the first time in a while in this cutscene, saying how he's disappointed that they don't do anything anymore since he thought they had something special. Well, for right now, it's time for some brotherly bonding by going after whoever has been stealing the product. Except... Lance is a really bad liar, and it's pretty obvious from the get-go that he's lying about who is responsible, blaming the losses on the bikers, and coming up with a plan to take a helicopter he apparently just has, and going after a bunch of them on the other side of town. Now, Lance will shoot here from the side of the heli, but both his position, relative to whatever he's shooting at, and the angle of the helicopter, will affect what he shoots, or if he shoots or not. If the heli is even the slightest bit tilted, he won't shoot at all, so when we come across the first group of bikers driving across Starfish Island, we have to hover over them, making sure Lance is facing the right direction, and then give him a chance to let loose before being given our second objective. There are even more bikers holed up in that one building under perpetual construction near downtown, so we clean up some on the ground and a few on the roof before we get shot down in a cutscene, and Lance hilariously falls out of the heli like a sack of potatoes, straight down. And then we crash, both of us somehow miraculously surviving the ordeal, despite how fatal it definitely should have been. On the ground, somehow a whole gaggle of new bikers have also spawned in, which means the game wants us to now carefully chew our way through them to reach Lance. But thankfully, by now I have so much money that I have effectively infinite ammo for everything, including my sniper and rockets. So from a distance I take out all the bikers on the ground, and then make my way upstairs to take out a few more. We then find Lance in a room at the back, which honestly makes no sense. He says that he fell and landed on some bikers, but like, huh? So he fell out of a helicopter at least eight or nine stories up. His fall was then broken by some bikers, but then what? He was like kidnapped by them and locked in a room inside this construction complex? All in the space of like, what, a minute? Huh? I mean, he couldn't have literally landed in that room. The building's roof was complete. So the only thing that makes sense is for him to have been brought to this room by the bikers after surviving this fall, right? Like, I have no idea how any of this makes the least bit of sense, because it doesn't. Anyway, once Lance is free, he steals a bike and drives off into the sunset. What a guy. That's one more mission complete, though. Maybe I was wrong about these last missions being a little bit more complicated. So far, it seems more like we get three easy ones and then one hard one to compensate for the simplicity of the others. So let's see what the Wheel of Fortune has in store for us next with another mission for Rennie. As it turns out, more simplicity. We go to see Rennie at the film studio, and they are becoming frustrated with whatever their film shoot is supposed to be. While Vic is getting frustrated that Rennie does not have an infinitely long list of clients prepared to buy enormous shipments of his product. What a conundrum. Well, for reasons that aren't actually well explained, Vic agrees to once again help them with their shoot in exchange, I presume, for more contacts, but that isn't actually explicitly spelled out. I learned something while doing this mission. 
The VNN news reports, which play after some missions, will continue to repeat over and over and over again until you let them play in their entirety, which can, in some instances, completely butcher the momentum of an otherwise action-packed mission, like this one. So the first few minutes of running this jet ski course for Rennie were done while listening to the news. How fun! But then it was back to some good old V-Rock to complete a few jumps around the golf course before reaching land and having to switch to a motorbike. It's literally just a checkpoint race, and once again, it's very simple. So I guess I spoke too soon earlier, but trust me, even if it doesn't look like it right now, there are some truly annoying missions coming up. Believe you me, just not yet, I guess. Stop making me look like a liar, game. Now, as it turns out, there are only two missions for Gonzalez. Three if you count the one that we did that he was in for Rennie, but anyways, this next one in his list is Purple Haze. This is also the mission which explicitly sets up his appearance in the original VC, taking place two years later, because in this mission, he asks us to help him sell some of his colonel's product, which he has cut for himself to make a side profit. So we have to go and grab his van full of this stuff, and then go to a meeting point in Washington Beach. However, as we're waiting for the customers to arrive, we are ambushed by two guys driving a big-ass truck. They slam it into the front of the van, knocking Vic unconscious and literally launching his body out the back of the truck, which if you really think about it, that must have been one crazy crash. But anyway, it also launched the drugs everywhere, and Vic lands in a big pile of the stuff, becoming unintentionally high as hell. So we have to call Gonzalez to let him know what happened, and then Vic reassures him that we will get the stuff back by heading to their party on Starfish Island, and performing a little ambush of our own. When I get there, I realized something. VCS has such a horrible draw distance, and enemies are only capable of attacking you from so close, that you can, in some situations, such as this one, or that last Lance mission, just hang back, whip out the sniper, and take out the baddies without ever actually having to engage with them and potentially lose health. So I managed to take out all of the enemies without a single civilian casualty. Nice. Remember back at the beginning how I said that I was at least trying in the start to roleplay what feels appropriate for the character? Well, I've mostly been keeping up with that, honestly. I mean, it depends on how you look at it, I guess. There's no way to confirm civilian kills in the game's stats, but I swear, I basically never run over pedestrians and always do my best as Vic to not shoot innocent people. So for once, I'm actually keeping up appearances. Although, my opinion on whether Vic would or not do these kinds of things has maybe changed. Anyway, I grab the van and then have to drive back and... Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this whole mission is done with a literal purple haze, hence the title on the screen. The controls are a bit funky and driving is a bit wonky since this is meant to simulate Vic being high as fuck on the colonel's stuff. It isn't nearly as bad as something like, say, GTA 4, though, so honestly, it barely makes a difference. Grab the van, drive it back to the lockup with a mere two-star wanted level, and that's it. Mission complete. But, like I said with this, Gonzalez declares that our business relationship is over. Although, now that I think about it, he will be seen one more time, I think, just not as the boss of a mission. But we'll get to that soon enough. You know, screw what I said about the missions in this third of the game being exclusively harder. Some are, sure, but just as many are stupid easy. Even easier than some of the earliest missions. Case in point, White Lies. So it's here that the truth, which anybody paying attention will have already figured out, is revealed. Lance has been the one using all the coke that's going missing, but real quick, let's just examine that. Lance has single-handedly been using enough product to actually be noticed and be causing a significant decline in profits. Like, he is using an amount equivalent to, like, a full-sized sale that we would make to an organization that would probably then sell it to a lot of people. And remember, Vic and Lance are not street-level dealers. They take large orders and help distribute them through Vic's empire. 
meaning these are not small amounts or small shipments that Lance is single-handedly consuming. I don't even want to imagine how much, but let's just say he is on an absolute crap ton of drugs. Like, holy crap. More importantly, though, which we see as the cutscene begins, he... Uh, Vic? Vic, are you... are you gonna move... Oh god, that was weird. Anyway, as we see here, Lance and Louise have also been hanging out and doing drugs together. It's also therefore implied that they might have been sleeping together, but neither of them will ever outright confirm if that's true. And given that they both deny it, I tend to think that they're telling the truth. Lance I could see easily lying about this to Vic, but not Louise. But regardless, Vic now thinks that and is sufficiently pissed at both of them. So the actual mission here involves, uh, well, Lance runs off and, uh, gets into a helicopter and then just starts dumping the product out the side of the helicopter to prove something. I honestly have no idea. This is so goddamn gamey and nonsensical, but sure, they needed some kind of objective to put here, and this was, I guess, the best they could come up with. So we, as the player, have to follow his drug-fueled hijinks using a new vehicle introduced with this mission, the hovercraft, meaning it goes over both land and sea. So it's basically just a slower, less engaging checkpoint race with no time limit, and well, that's it. Mission complete. Wow, that one was important narratively, at least. The cutscene was, but the actual gameplay was complete and utter crap. Ping pong! Back to Rennie for something a little more engaging that sets up a much more interesting and frustrating mission later on. So we get to see more of Phil Collins here, who is a bit worried about his upcoming gig at the stadium downtown due to the whole, you know, Liberty City mob bosses trying to have him and his manager killed thing. So Barry asks us to head down to the stadium before Phil arrives for rehearsals and to make sure everything is on the up and up. So this mission can actually be kind of tricky, and is one where having infinite sprint is an absolute boon. The whole thing is on a timer. You're given roughly five minutes or so to get down to the stadium, run around the entire perimeter, taking out bad guys, and then also head downstairs and take out a big group of assassins, all before Phil arrives. Honestly, if it weren't for Infinite Sprint, this one can often come down to the wire, unless you have a really fast car at the beginning to really cut down on the travel time, but even then, it's tight. But luckily, I do have super speed and a whole crap ton of bullets to waste, so it doesn't end up being too much of a struggle, but still, it keeps me on my toes as I'm running around the building. It's also pretty neat getting to finally see the inside of this place beyond those event missions from the original VC. Wait, those were a thing, right? I'm not just, like, imagining some fever dream from the stadiums in San Andreas. Anyways... You don't actually get much time to admire just how big of an open space this place is because you're on the clock, so shoot, shoot, and shoot some more before taking out the last one on the perimeter and getting a card to unlock the basement. Down there, you'll find the assassins literally planning to plant a bomb. Jesus, is all of this really worth a $3 billion debt? Hold on, hold on, one sec. Oh... Yeah, that's like just shy of 10 million in today's money, so maybe it is. Wait, how the hell did Barry become that indebted to Giorgio Ferrelli? What in the hell did he use the money for? Whatever. Point is that they're all dead now and Phil can safely begin rehearsals. We'll get to his actual concert a little bit later. Well, speaking of the missions, which can be hard slash frustrating, which I've been alluding to... <sighs> Steal the deal. So, after that last one, Rennie pages us and gives us access to a new contact, yet another big name in the industry and returning character, none other than Ricardo Diaz. And, well, in our first mission for him, he wants us to track down a shipment that Monsieur Gonzalez is trying to move into the city without his permission. Oh, and it turns out Lance has already been hanging out with Diaz before we arrive and also doing some truly disgusting things by the sound of it. 
So we go with Lance to try and find a lead on the shipment of Gonzalez's, starting with the most obvious spot, according to Lance anyway, the Pole Position Strip Club. After waiting outside, we eventually spot one of his men on their way out, and then, ugh, we have to tail them. Yup, it's one of those missions. But it's actually much worse, because once we tail them over to Washington Beach, then they jump onto a jet ski and have to continue being tailed. I ended up failing the first time because for some reason, I assumed once we got on the water I could just follow him as normal, but I don't know why I assumed that and also nope. On my second attempt, I actually reached the destination, which is a floating series of platforms just off of Ocean Beach. But once there, the game asks you to sneak in, take out the guards while avoiding sentries, and steal a boat full of product. Screw that! So I just ran in like a crazy person and tried escaping on the boat until... Oh, uh, what the actual mother of f On my third attempt, I did, however, manage to pull off the quick escape, which is very good because after trying the damn mission three times, I had no interest in possibly failing again by clowning around on the platforms with a bunch of goons shooting at me. It's entirely unnecessary though since they don't even pursue you or do any damage once you jump in the boat, and it's exceedingly easy to reach it and then escape without taking any real damage so yes yeah, screw that. So deliver the boat to Diaz's mansion after that and finally mission complete. That one wasn't particularly hard, really, so much as it was just freaking long and tedious and annoying. Anyways, so the next mission I did was technically one for Lance, but it's another one of those that's really more of a Vic mission. At Lance's place, he is still recovering from his last little episode, and meanwhile, Louise calls looking for Vic specifically. See, somewhere in between the last few missions, you get a pager message from none other than Jerry Martinez, saying he's no longer working with the feds and instead has come back to Vice to screw with us for reasons unexplained. And well, his first goal is to hurt Vic as much as possible by going after whatever he loves. In this case, that sadly means Louise. So she says that she's being watched and followed by Martinez's men around town and that she's currently holed up at a burger bar in Little Havana. Vic is initially cold and distant, but once he realizes Louise is in real danger, he sobers up. If only the same could be said for Lance, though. So, first things first, we need to head down to this burger bar in Little Havana to find that Louise has already been kidnapped, and a group of thugs try to slow us down. Take them out, and then it's a race to downtown, where there are three possible spots that she's being held. I think the actual location she's at changes every time you do the mission, so you always have a 1 in 3 chance of finding her the first time, and while you're looking, her health continuously drains. When you do find her, you then gotta drive her back to the hospital downtown to get her some help and... Uh, nasty. Thanks for sharing. Anyways, mission complete. And now, for real for real, we are in the end game. Only a handful of missions left and things should start really ramping up from here, if my memory serves. Alright, so next up we have The Exchange. No, not that The Exchange, different game. So, we need to help Diaz sell a shipment of the product that we previously helped him steal off of Gonzalez's men to the DEA for a bit of extra profit. So we hop into a van with one of his men, and then head to the deal downtown behind Lance's old hotel. But it turns out Gonzalez's men have shown up for revenge, and now I gotta snipe all the other snipers and... Oh. Oh my, what is... Oh god, what what's happening here? Um... Okay, this is fine. It's perfectly fine. Everything is fine. I can handle a bit of slowdown. There, see? Um... So the game definitely didn't just crash. Nope. I am definitely not at all now worried that I've been hardlocked from completing the game and thus finishing this video that I've been working on for two weeks. 
No, 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 nope, 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 not happening. La, 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 la. Well, so I tried looking up online some potential remedies and decided to finally update my version of PCSX2, as well as update my version of C++ Visual Distributor, and that's gotta be it, right? Right? I restart the computer, give it another try, and... I ended up having like three more crashes before finally seeing a suggestion in one of the forums related to somebody having a completely different crash. Did you try not using save states? Oh god. Oh god, I forget this can be a problem sometimes, okay? Look, I haven't been, um, horribly abusing save states, but playing games that ask you to repeat the same crap over and over when you die can be, well, tedious and a bit mind-numbing, so yes. Yes, okay, I have been using save states to save myself some time here and there, like in the last Diaz mission, Steal the Deal, which also had a shitload of tedious objectives that if failed meant you'd have to spend basically five minutes plus every time getting back to where you were. But I haven't been using them every single time I die, just when I die at particularly frustrating moments. And also, I've been using them whenever I close the emulator, as it offers me the nice, convenient option of it booting up the next time exactly where I left off, so I have been taking advantage of that too. As it turns out, and I wish I could say this was all born of ignorance, but I've been using emulators a long time, I've experienced this kind of crap before, hell, I am 90% sure I experienced this exact same issue before, when recording the footage for GTA biographies years ago, but like, that was years ago. I didn't remember, okay? So, this is all a long way of saying that safe states and emulators can be great, but they can also cause you a great deal of panic and frustration too, so choose your battles or, I don't know, something. Point is, for better or worse, I won't be using safe states much for the remainder of the playthrough and, oh god. Oh god, Light My Pyre is coming up. Oh god. Okay, so, um, anyways, I eventually tried going to one of my businesses after purposefully failing the mission, saving the game manually, and then doing a fresh boot, and lo and behold, the sniper works now, and I can actually load the next scene. Thank god. And now, all I have to do is drive this truck back to Dia- What? What? So yeah, on top of the mission causing me a bunch of grief because of my own hubris and impatience, it is also just straight up an annoying mission. That section fighting against the snipers is rather tight in terms of the time limit, and when driving the truck back, I swear to god it's made of paper because it catches fire several times in like no time flat. I ended up cheating a little bit but not using safe states. No, instead, I snuck around back behind these buildings and into Little Havana where, as I suspected, the game had no pre-planned spawn points for the enemies, allowing me to escape them entirely, and then all I had to do was deal with the one guy guarding the bridge to Starfish Island. But after all of that, I finally, finally completed the mission, and thank god because this mission alone almost single-handedly killed this entire video 80% of the way through the script. Jesus, I need a break. What's next? Well, it turns out there is another Gonzalez mission, technically. It's just done under less than ideal circumstances for the man himself. See, that last mission was an attempt by him to get even with Diaz, but thanks to us, it didn't work out. Well, this time we head to Diaz's place to find Gonzalez being threatened and blackmailed by Ricardo, into telling him about any and all shipments he ever has brought into Vice, which further sets up the events at the beginning of the original VC and fleshes out the reason why Gonzalez betrayed the colonel. So, we have to help escort Gonzalez safely to the airport, where he'll be leaving the country to meet with Cortez, and eventually he'll help Vic to set up his own deal back in Vice, but I'm getting ahead of myself for now. So we have a thoroughly intense on-rail turret mission. This one is actually pretty tough though, or at least it ended up being fun since I didn't fail it a bunch and have to restart, but it did get especially hairy and a bit scary when Gonzalez's truck almost blew up in the first part of the mission. 
Once he actually reaches the airport, you then have to go back and forth between two terminal entrances of the airport, shooting down every last shark gang member in the state, I assume, since we otherwise haven't seen them at all since taking over all of their former businesses. The game is set to play V-Rock again here, so mowing down the baddies to Queen of the Reich is a quite intense and very enjoyable escalation of events as we near the end of the game. The last bit sees us directly defending Gonzalez's plane from attacks as he makes his final runway getaway, and then zoom, he's off, and we get one more well-earned mission complete. Phew. Okay, now things are getting intense. I guess I just called it a bit too soon before. I wonder if I've unlocked the minigun for purchase now after using the M60 for that mission, by the way. Might as well go check. Yep. So, next up, we have another mission for the Mendez brothers. Now, it was never said explicitly as far as I remember, but apparently, the deal with them has been that we help to earn back the profits they lost of that initial shipment of product that we stole from Jerry, and then Lance and Vic could leave forever, and neither of their families would be in danger. All things considered, that is a good deal. The Mendez brothers are, after all, terrifying, and also the kind of people who got into this line of work intentionally, unlike our reluctant drug-dealing protagonist. Lance being upset about this deal makes sense, but Vic... Well, actually, it also makes sense that Vic gets upset, but only when you actually understand his character arc. See, Vic is self-righteous, holier-than-thou, to a T. But secretly, he's actually one of the most violent, most insane, and most hypocritical of all GTA protagonists. I think now I finally understand him. He never wanted massive wealth or to even be involved in this business at all, but as soon as he was given even the slightest push, he embraced it because this is who Vic has been all along, but he's been in denial. He is actually a complete maniac, as should be rather evident by his particularly screwed-up dialogue when shooting people in rampages or accidentally targeting NPCs on the street. I won't even play some of these because they are truly messed up, but, um, how should I put this? I used to think those dialogues of him were almost an oversight because he says things like how killing makes him, well, excited, if you know what I mean, but now... Now I think he was telling the truth the whole time. Victor is actually one of the worst GTA protagonists in terms of screwed up moral compasses, and it took me a long time to finally see it this way, because as recently as the beginning of this playthrough, I still thought of him as one of the more grounded characters, like Nico Bellic. But there's something so much worse about a hypocrite. The devil you know versus the devil you don't, I think. Anyway, Armando has both brothers knocked out, and for some incredibly stupid reason, doesn't just execute them then and there. Instead, the Mendezes have them brought out to a gas works near the airport to be executed only once they wake up. And for some even dumber reason, the assassins decide to perform their little firing squad directly in front of a flammable pipe. Well, uh, this works out in Vic and Lance's favor, but not in theirs. So, we are then stripped of all weapons and separated from Lance because of the plumes of fire forcing us to go all the way around to reach him while shooting three separate shutoff valves to reach Lance and also staying alive against the Mendez goons' onslaught. But eventually, I pull it off and it makes for a nice dramatic end to working directly for the other brothers. Lance and Vic hop on a motorcycle together and make one last daring escape as the place blows up and... Whew, Things are seriously getting intense now. Lance heads off afterwards, saying he has a plan for striking back, though, so we'll see where that leads soon enough. Well, it's war. Full-blown war with the Mendez cartel, and our next mission sees us once again having to defend businesses in that war. Unlike the last time the Mendez brothers attacked us, though, this time we actually have to go and defend three separate places with Lance at our side. Also, Lance brings Phil Cassidy and Umberto Rabina and his Cubans along to help, and allows us to spread out and defend Vic's empire. Now, here's a mission where having the minigun really pays off. It's basically three gang attacks on businesses that have to be completed within a certain time limit, 
But in my experience, the hardest part of this mission for me has always been exercising control when using the minigun, so as not to accidentally shoot down Lance ourselves. Otherwise, it's a rather simple, if appropriately intense, series of gunfights, but once the third business is cleared, that's it. Mission complete. Still intense, but definitely fun. Around this time, I get another page from Rennie, who desperately needs our help. Turns out that Diego Mendez is trying to have them killed now, because, for one, it was Rennie who introduced us to Ricardo Diaz, a direct competitor and enemy of the Mendez brothers, and two, Diego is terrified of people finding out that he and Rennie used to be an item, something the game plays up for laughs. So, real quick, I know I said I made my opinions on Rennie clearer in other videos, and I have, but I had so many thoughts doing this mission that I just have to share them. Before I say anything else, I want to be explicitly clear. Rennie is most definitely not an accurate or appropriate depiction of a trans person for two primary reasons. Number one, you cannot get a sex change surgery four times in real life. You simply can't, and no doctor on Earth operating in a facility that actually has the required equipment would ever agree to such a thing for various medical reasons. And number two, they were very clearly written from the perspective of cis people, and also with the intention of primarily being a joke. Especially their intense hyperfixation on sexuality, and how somebody who changes their gender presentation like this, especially their actual sex organ, must be doing so only because they have some abnormally high libido and just want to have sex with everyone. Those are very toxic and inherently transphobic parts of Rennie's characterization. That being said, if I take Rennie for what they are and imagine them as the gender-fluid queen-slash-king they were unintentionally written as, I freaking love them. And it's clear that Rennie is supposed to be a character you sympathize with, which further endears me to them. Even if the people who wrote them were making fun of trans people to a certain extent, they didn't dehumanize us, and they wrote Rennie as an ally to the protagonist, and as a fun one, so I can't help but love them. So, this actual mission involves two bits. Rennie is going to make their way to the hospital for a fourth sex change, back to presenting female, and so we have to hold the fort at the film studio while they're off and make sure that the Mendez goons don't make it inside any of the hangars and discover that Rennie is already gone. So the first part is an intense back and forth between two film studio entrances, gunning down anybody who gets too close. Eventually, Rennie pages us and says that they're in trouble, so we have to go rescue them nearby the Malibu Club. Unfortunately, I may have been a bit too ambitious with my minigun and accidentally gunned them down the first time trying to complete the mission, but the second time, I managed to pull off the save. I just want to play this little cutscene for any of the would-be bigots who are still watching this video... somehow. You're gonna die, you freak of nature! Freak? I'm an artist. I'm sensitive, and I'm going to kill all of your filthy f***ers. Big, save me! Again, I still have my problems with Rennie's portrayal, but you cannot argue to me that at least a substantial writing force at Rockstar fully supports transition and treating people with the respect they deserve regardless of presentation, so suck on that. I would say all of Rockstar, but... I am not forgetting that just a few years later, after this, we also got Rudy Diavanzo, but still, I fucking love Rennie. Get them safely to the hospital and bam, mission complete. Only a few more to go, and from my memory, they are all just as, or more intense than the last few have been, so strap in. Our next one is a slight break from the volume being all the way up at 12, though, in Lost and Found. Martinez lets word leak that he's planning on going after Louise again as she recovers at the hospital, but Lance tries to convince Vic to let the hospital's security handle things, since they apparently have some kind of big deal coming in today. Well, unsurprisingly, Vic doesn't go for that, and instead we have to head over to the hospital downtown to see to Louise. When we get there, though, we find that she's absolutely fine and in no danger whatsoever. Instead, we get a page from Lance asking for help, saying that he's trapped in a burning building and needs us to come rescue him using a helicopter. Martinez set us up with the classic divide-and-conquer method. Louise, though, also unsurprisingly, is actually down to help, or at least come along for yet another truly extraordinary date. 
In fact, it's her idea to steal the rescue chopper on top of the hospital to save him. So off we go. Once we reach Lance, he tells us that Martinez's men ambushed him and took whatever product he was meant to be selling or collecting or whatever. It's never specified. All that matters is they are now getting away in some boats just off the beach, and we have to go and get them. So, it's like that mission taking out the bikers earlier. We have to reach the three boats and give Lance enough time to take out everyone aboard by keeping the heli level for him. It makes for an interesting, if a bit precarious, scenario, but the momentum of this finale is still keeping me going and I managed to get through it first try with minimal BS. But I did actually have to pay attention, so while this may have been a bit more relaxed, it certainly wasn't simple, I don't think. I also love how casual Louise is as we drop her off. Louise, I'll call you real soon. Oh, okay. I'm kind of in the middle of a war right now. It's okay. I'll wait. But savor that moment, Victor. Savor that moment. Next up, we have what is probably one of the most unique missions in the entire Grand Theft Auto franchise. Domo arigato, domestabato. So, if you've paid attention to the radio adverts in the original VC, or I think also in this game, you may have heard mention of a personal robot servant people can buy called Domestobot. Now, this is a reference to both the fact that such fads and talk of robots had indeed become big by the 1980s, but I also think this is a direct reference to Rocky IV when Rocky's brother-in-law, Polly, has a robot of very similar design and function, and that movie is, in a lot of ways, an encapsulation of the 80s in movie form. So, the actual mission here is about trying to also ruin Armando Mendez by destroying his bearer bonds, a job that Lance agreed to do after also agreeing to pay back Diaz for an undisclosed amount of money that he borrowed at 25% interest weekly, otherwise the Vance brothers work for Diaz. Well, Lance makes this agreement while also high off his ass, and Diaz isn't a man to be trifled with, nor a man that Vic and Lance need an enemy in at a time like this, so the task of somehow managing to destroy Armando's fortune falls to Vic alone. Luckily though, before he got super high, Lance did actually come up with a rather ingenious plan to accomplish this task. As it happens, Armando has recently bought for himself one of those Domestobots, and Lance somehow manages to get his hands on technology, allowing us to hack and control that robot from a parked van outside the Mendez mansion. So, the actual mission is somewhat radiant. You have to locate Armando's personal safe, crack it open, and then set fire to his bonds, all the while having to do various chores for him as he asks, and these tasks will be created every 30 seconds or so that you don't find the safe itself. So, you are put into this very unique first-person view and inside the actual mansion, which is just really cool. You can be asked by Armando to clean trash, toilets, grab him some food, give him a light for his cigar, and who knows, maybe even more. I only ended up doing like two of these because pretty quickly I remembered that the safe was in the basement and that the basement entrance was through the kitchen, but a truly curious player doing this for the first time might just take the time to explore since, once again, this is a truly unique mission for a GTA game. We never have to do something like this in the series ever again. It's a truly one-off kind of an experience. When you finally do locate the safe, you have to play a simple but rather annoying little minigame to find the right code, and I'm going to be honest, having done a hard save before starting this mission properly, I did end up using save states again to defeat this instead of having to fail, drive all the way back to the Diaz Mansion, and then all the way back to Prawn Island just for another shot at it. Sue me. Open the safe, switch to Domestobot's lighter arm, and burn baby burn. You lousy piece of crap! You've ruined me! Do you require a light? Mission complete, baby. Speaking of truly unique missions in the Grand Theft Auto franchise, next we have the final mission for Rennie, In the Air Tonight, and what an appropriately named mission it is. We meet Rennie, Phil, and Barry at the hospital, where Rennie has just completed their apparent fourth sex change, and is now presenting female once again, but unfortunately for them, they won't be able to accompany us to Phil's concert downtown, since Diego Mendez still wants them dead. 
So, in our first normal part of the mission, we have to simply get Rennie to safety to Escobar International so they can catch a flight to Europe where they plan to conquer the adult film industry, apparently. That turns out to be stupid simple. At one point, Rennie does start freaking out since I guess they saw someone coming after us, and I do think some of the Mendez thugs are scripted to attack, but I was either too quick or took the right routes, and I completely avoided them. So, after seeing Rennie off, it's time to head over to the stadium for the real mission. Or the really interesting part, anyway. We have to now actively defend Phil Collins while he performs the titular song in the mission title. Rendered completely in-engine, just like a real Phil Collins concert from the 80s. We find that there are yet more of Giorgio Ferrelli's men up on the light rig above the stage, and it falls to us to take them out while they try and cut the cables and cause it to fall onto Phil, killing him. Now in the past, I have really struggled with this mission. It can be very difficult to reach the cable cutters in time, since the game gives you like three seconds, literally, to reach them. But I finally figured it out this time. The game even tells you, but I am notoriously bad at following instructions sometimes, especially simple ones. You actually have the ability to grab onto NPCs with triangle and then beat them up, which also stops them from cutting the cable. Coming into this mission with full armor and health, as well as fully upgraded armor and health, plus the knowledge that all I need to do is disrupt their cutting, made the whole thing a lot easier. Then it's simply a matter of taking out three or four attempts in two separate waves, in between getting to actually watch Phil perform. If you're a GTA fan, and a Phil Collins fan, and you've somehow never seen this full performance, I highly recommend you look it up. It's a nostalgia overload, and both hilarious and awesome at the same time. Something we've never seen in a GTA game before or since. After saving Phil's life for the third time, though this time without his knowledge, we bid him adieu, as now we have to go and wrap up our own spiraling dramatic tale of drugs and revenge. In fact, it is now time to tackle what I have on more than one occasion referred to as the single worst mission in the entire history of the GTA franchise. Light. My. Pyre. Ah oh boy. Here we freaking go, but this time I am going in fully prepared for what I'm getting myself into. So I bought myself one of the bulletproof limos, parked it outside, and then went in for one of the hardest missions the series has ever produced. But I'm a veteran of this mission, and at this point... I have played it and failed it so many times, you could say that my hopes were high that I'd be able to actually complete it on maybe the first couple tries. We learn from Louise's sister that she has been kidnapped by Armando Mendez. This is especially tragic because what triggers this mission being available is Louise paging Vic to say that they should finally go on another date, and how she'll meet Vic at Lance's place. When Vic starts to charge outside to save her, Lance tries to stop him at first, only becoming fully invested in taking down Armando when his goons outside blow up his silver and furnace, causing him to jump on that bike that he stole earlier and start charging towards the mansion. It should also be noted that Vic was given yet another opportunity here to save Louise, since Armando says that if they both leave the city, she'll live. Whether or not he was being honest is an entirely different question, but it's Lance's action of charging that causes Vic to go after him, and thus, in a very real way, What's about to happen is all Lance's fault. Well, maybe not all his fault, but somewhat his fault. So, the mission begins, and not surprisingly, my bulletproof limo despawned, but I also now know about a bike by this tree that you can grab to be able to shoot ahead of yourself instead of using a car and having to take out the Mendez's cars while Lance is constantly in the crossfire. Now, I don't know if it was the bike, all my previous attempts and previous runs of this game or my sheer will to not be stuck here repeating this mission for the next hour, but I swear to you, for the first time in my life, I got all the way to Prawn Island the very first try. The bike you can grab lets you actually get ahead of Lance, and that is the ticket because there are a total of three cars that Lance will get into fights with, all of which can very easily drain his health down to zero, and it's Lance dying in this first stretch of the mission which makes it so freaking annoying and difficult. Take out the first car, take out the second, take out the third, and then it's a smooth drive to the island where Lance charges in head first. Now, this second part has us storming the mansion, but thankfully there is no time limit, so using my minigun and M4, 
I very slowly and deliberately took my time, being very careful, to always watch my radar for newly spawning goons. Lost all my armor, but that upgrade definitely helped, and eventually, I pushed my way inside the mansion for a final confrontation with Armando Mendez, who claims that Louise and Lance are already dead upstairs, as he pulls out a flamethrower for a true boss fight moment. Well, guess what, Armando? Not only do I have a freaking minigun, but I am also literally fireproof. Poor choice of weapon, buddy. Oh my god, I just beat Light by a Pyre in one try. I've never done that before. I wish I could properly communicate to you how satisfying this was if you've never played this mission yourself three billion times, but oh my god, I can't believe I did this. But it also unlocks for us one of the saddest cutscenes in the entire Grand Theft Auto series. Uh, Luis! Uh, uh, hey, Vic. You came for me. No one ever really did much for me before. That's sweet of you. Hey, hey, come on. Let's, let's get you to a hospital. I don't think there's much point in that. Come on, Louise. We could have had something special. Yeah. We did have something special. Make sure Mary Jo takes care of my baby. <laughs> oh, Louise. <sighs> Louise. <sighs> oh. uh. Vic, I, I know you cared about her, man. But she wasn't right for you. Vic. Hey, Vic. Family's what matters. Oh, damn. All right. All right. Okay, I'm gonna make it. I can make it. I know I can, man. Now, as sad as it is, I was tempted to write that the gloves are now off because Louise is among the most innocent and good characters in the series. And she, well, kinda is, but she is by no means innocent or good, or the most innocent. I mean, she endangered her own baby many times for the sake of going on dates or just having fun, and she's an instigator who pushed Vic into getting into this life to begin with. She's certainly far from good, but as far as GTA characters go... She is certainly one of the more sympathetic and relatable, especially to me now. So her death is definitely felt and still one of the only scenes in the entire series that has ever managed to make me cry. But now, for Vic anyway, the gloves are off. Only two more missions to go, one Mendez brother down, one to go. And then of course, there's Martinez. Let's finish this. All right, the penultimate mission in the game, over the top. So, to get to Diego, Diaz has an insane, harebrained idea that's so crazy, it just might work. We're going to steal a recently delivered hunter attack chopper from Fort Baxter and use that to reach Mendez, holed up at the top floor of a building in downtown. In order to get the helicopter, though, for some reason that makes sense in the story but ultimately feels pointless in the gameplay, we need a decoy. So, Vic thinks of Phil Cassidy immediately. We head down to see Phil but also have to deal with a single assassin car coming after us on the way, which is nothing. When we find him, he is instantly ready to help avenge Louise, and also gets emotional for one of, possibly, the only times in the series. Truly seeming upset about the loss of his sister, or at least expressing that as best as he can as a drunk, mostly insane man. Alright, time to head back to where this all began. Now, when we actually reach the base... Phil uses his moonshine truck to cause a distraction and blow up the front gates, but like, then we just sneak in from the side. The game also encourages us to remain stealthy and sneak past the guards and avoid the spotlights, but like, what exactly did Phil do here? It's not like his attack got the guards to concentrate on the main gate while we infiltrate or 
anything, so again, it could have worked and made sense here, but ultimately it felt kind of pointless for him to be here. Anyway, pretty quickly I drop all pretense of going in stealthy and just mow down every soldier in my path with the minigun, first making my way to the admin building, where we have to open up the gate to the hunter. You know, the game gives you the goal of leave the admin building before the hunter takes off, but like, there were literally only two enemies inside the whole building, and reaching the explicitly marked on the map console room took all of like two seconds. It looks like time and effort went into making some of the other rooms inside here, but it feels pointless. Like, who is going to have to spend two minutes leaving this building or get lost looking for the objective? Like, who? Anyway, outside, then we have to take the long way around to the hunter, but once again, why the hell have they already not just flown away? There is, quite literally, already a guy inside the chopper, but for reasons that are never properly or well explained, he just sits there for three minutes preparing to take off before the mission fails. This one feels like it could have had a much tighter time limit, especially given what the game has expected you to pull off with missions like Light My Pyre. It's a strange change of pace because, especially being as well armed as I am, this whole thing was a breeze. Jump in the chopper and fly it back to Diaz and now we're ready. One more mission to go. It's time for Last Stand. So, this is it. We take the hunter and charge Mendez's building downtown. Now, this is another mission which I for sure have struggled with in the past, but it's appropriate. It's also one I've often thought of as among my favorite finale missions in the series. When we arrive at the building, our first goal is to simply decimate it with missiles. Take out as many guards as we possibly can, and that's what I do. I don't even take any damage while doing so, but the one downside is that the hunter does not have a radio, so this whole bit is done in utter silence when it definitely could have used some appropriately epic tunes. Eventually, one of Mendez's goons shoots down the helicopter with a rocket launcher, but Vic just barely manages to land it on the roof and escape. So then, we have to make our way through the building, and based on the loadout it provides us on the roof, just in case for some reason we showed up with zero weapons, it expects us to be able to do it with just an AK-47, a rocket launcher, and some body armor. But I, I have a minigun. And the minigun, in fact, has what I think is the longest lock-on range in the game, and also the fastest kill time, and frankly, it makes this whole mission kind of a joke. Like, the only time I took any real damage was when I couldn't fire the gun because the animation locked up when I got stuck on this wall. But beyond that, every enemy fell before they even got much of a chance to shoot at me. And eventually, when Martinez arrives, he orders his helicopter to flush us out and onto the roof to face him. But with a minigun, the heli goes down almost instantly. It's all a bit anticlimactic. Speaking of which... On the roof, we are confronted by both Mendez and Martinez and have to take out the two of them in a one-on-two fight. Which, under other circumstances, might be a quite difficult fight, but... Once again, minigun go brr. And boop. Done and done. And with that, the final cutscene plays, and I have completed Vice City Stories. So, 18 years after its original release, 17 after this version's original release, what are my thoughts on GTA Vice City Stories? And how does it stack up next to the other games from its era, like the original VC, San Andreas, and the other stories title. Well, Vice City Stories is very much a mixed bag, I would say. I have said it many times before in different contexts, and I'll say it again here, but I believe that VCS has both some of the best and worst missions in the whole 3D era. But its biggest limitation, the thing holding it back the most, is something that it can't really help, and that is the limitations of its original hardware. Hot take incoming, but for me personally, I enjoy the story of Vice City Stories a lot more than the original Vice City. The characters are more fleshed out, get more opportunities to explore their interpersonal relationships and what makes them tick, partly by virtue of being a prequel, but also, it just feels a lot more grounded and less cinematic, which in this case, for me, is a good thing. VCS is a story about hypocrisy. Vic's, Louise's, Lance's, it's a story about family, poverty, 
and the opportunities denied by and afforded to different people and parts of our society. I really don't think this was necessarily the intention, but VCS just happens to be a particularly poignant and quite frankly, woke, entry in the series for its exploration of the poverty that black people specifically in America have faced, with the Vance family struggling enough for Vic to find it necessary to get into the army while their white mother goes off and takes care of herself, and only herself, though nothing is ever really disclosed about the nature of their relationship with their father. VCS also showcases, whether it was meant to or not, the life of the only trans person in the series' history, who gets any real screen time anyway, and one who, while still rooted in some negative stereotypes, is ultimately presented as an ally to the player and a human being, whose struggle to be recognized for the unique person that they are is highlighted as being more important than the bigots who choose to dismiss them as subhuman. The original VC was still set in the 80s and thus dripped that 80s sexual ambiguity that is joked about on various in-game radio stations, but Vice City Stories, more so than the original I think, embraces this aspect of its historical setting in a way that resonates with me a lot more today than it ever possibly could have before. The glam, the pastel color palettes, the music, I mean come on, this is the music video for a song that appears in-game. So arguably VCS might even be gayer than the Ballad of Gay Tony at times and for that, I simply love it. But even beyond all of that, the story of VCS at its core is to me more interesting than Tommy Versetti's story. Tommy is a man who wants to be a big mobster, gets denied that because somebody above him fears him, gets put in prison for something that he didn't do, actually, only to get out later, and eventually claim that title, which he'd always wanted. A good enough story, sure, but VCS has so many more interesting angles and layers to view and explore it from, and just generally hits harder than anything in the original did for me at least. Vic Vance is a paradoxical and hypocritical character in a truly fascinating way. As Martinez says, he is trying to play the good guy in a bad man's game, but this makes for a more fascinating, more intriguing character capable of relationships which range from sympathetic and lovely to violent and psychopathic. His relationship with Phil, an ex-army soldier with some strongly racially discriminatory tendencies, his relationship with Marty, an actual out-and-out -out racist that gets to be put in his place by the player, his relationship with Martinez, an authority figure who sees him as nothing more than a useful tool for accomplishing his own tasks, a means to an end, his relationship with his brother, whose selfishness causes half of the problems that the two of them face, but whom Victor can't see as anything other than a burden, despite his own responsibility for so much of their perilous time in Vice. And of course, his relationship with Louise, which is, for me, the most interesting and heartbreaking relationship in the series, beyond perhaps Kate and Nico. When I think about it now, I would say that Kate's death is more tragic because she truly was innocent or certainly a lot more innocent in comparison to someone like Louise, but the fact that she dies right in his arms is honestly, I think, the saddest scene in the entire franchise's history, and it brings me to tears every single time. The original Vice City is good, I love it, but it does nothing to even compare to this in terms of the depth of its narrative, for me, not even close. But what about the gameplay? Well, when VCS is doing what it does best, it's essentially some of the best parts of San Andreas's gameplay presented in my all-time favorite Rockstar created city. However, it is pretty much inarguably a lot more stiff at times. The lack of a crouch mechanic, the stiffness of the lock-on system, the considerably reduced draw distance for both people and vehicles, which can make finding vehicles on the road impossible at times, or cause them to literally spawn right in front of you as you're driving, these are almost all limitations that exist because the original game was made on the PSP, and I don't know enough about how these things work to say why, but even when ported over to the PS2, it clearly wasn't as simple as bringing it up to the San Andreas level, or I imagine they would have done that. It was a port after all, not a remake, so it was limited by the code in the original version. But when some of these things are ignored or forgiven, it offers a better variety, I think, than the original did for a lot of its content. Improved and fleshed out side activities, 
including a checkpoint system for vigilante, paramedic, etc. The ability to purchase special vehicles, the whole empire system which is a lot more interesting and worth your time than the gang territories in San Andreas, the existence of interiors spread around the map just in case the player decides to try protection racket missions anywhere or is just feeling like role-playing, the ability to buy back weapons for a fee after a death or getting arrested, there are so many improvements that VCS brings to the table, and if it was able to run the way that San Andreas or the original did, it would easily beat out the original in every single category for me. Almost. It definitely does have a more mixed bag of missions. Some of its missions are so stupidly simple and easy that it's almost insulting. Not as bad as LCS from what I remember, but still definitely a problem. However, it also has some truly fantastic missions that are among the best the 3D era ever gave us. I mean, the game literally has an attendable Phil Collins performance. What more could I freaking ask for? I wish Vice City Stories wasn't limited by the hardware it was originally developed for, and it is because of that that it can be hard to say that it's better than San Andreas, but I definitely like it more than the original VC, and honestly, most days, also San Andreas. I just wouldn't necessarily try to argue the point for the latter. I really do think the biggest flaw with VCS is its technical limitations, like the draw distance issue and the difficulty spikes. If it had been developed as a PS2 title from the ground up, I have no doubt that the issues with its more simplistic missions, or its occasionally very frustrating difficulty, could have been fixed. The soundtrack is fantastic, as good or maybe even better than the original VC. The voice acting is top-notch as always, the story is, as I've said, even better than the original, the small quality of life improvements make it one of the smoothest and easily accessible titles of the 3D era, it has some of the most unique missions in the series' history, such as Domo Arigato Domestabato or In the Air Tonight, it has one of the best finale missions in the series, it has excellent pacing, excellent characters, thoughtful insights, and so, so, so much more. It's just an absolutely fantastic entry into the franchise, and it saddens me that so few people, comparatively anyways, have experienced it. Now, I do need to highlight that some of the missions, especially in the game's final stretch, are ridiculously difficult, and this is amazingly even worse when played on the original hardware of a PSP. I had a relatively smooth run this time around, specifically because I've done it all so many times before, and also had the added benefit of being able to play the game on an emulator, occasionally using safe states, and with a better controller, but that cannot take away from the fact that missions like Turn On, Tune In, Bug Out, Boom Shine, Blow Out, The Exchange, Light My Pyre, and plenty of others are excessively difficult or annoying, and that spike in difficulty between missions likely prevented people from actually seeing the game through to the end, which is bad design and should not be ignored. It isn't the best game in the series, I don't think. It has plenty of things that do still hold it back, but it is, I think, the best entry in the 3D era. At least for me it is. I would rather play it than 3, VC, LCS, or even San Andreas most of the time, and if it had the benefit of being a PS2 title from the beginning, I can only imagine this opinion would have been strengthened. I hope you've enjoyed this look at yet another entry into the Grand Theft Auto franchise, but going forward the plan is, anyways, to finally take a nice long break from the series while some hype builds up for the next game coming at us hopefully next fall. There will probably be some smaller one-off videos here and there akin to some of the stuff I put out earlier this year, but for the most part, I think I will be focusing on Game Vault episodes beyond the GTA series for a while for a variety of reasons. Now, I will probably be exploring another Rockstar-made game pretty soon here, and I'm guessing by the time most of you reach this actual part of the video, I will have switched to the weekly piece-by-piece -piece format once again. But if you want to see these episodes in their entirety right away, whenever a part 1 goes up, there should be a full version already available to my patrons and channel members, so if you just can't wait, consider signing up to support the channel and my work, where you'll also get access to a bunch of other neat stuff like a ton of original music that I've made for the channel over the years. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and thank you so much for watching. 
I'm the Criminal Historian, and I hope you have yourself a wonderful evening. Bye-bye!